In the Sixteen Kingdoms of the Two Jin Dynasty, a chaotic era that inherited the rebellion of the Eight Kings and ushered in the Southern and Northern Dynasties, various heroes competed to appear in the chaotic era that lasted for a hundred years. However, the most likely unification of the world, the former Qin, was shattered after the Battle of Feishui. When everything returned to the fourth year of the Huangshu era, if the young crown prince who defeated Huan Wen at Tongguan had not passed away, let's see if this outcome would have changed. Chapter 0 Preface You are listening at NovelFull.audio Since ancient times, there have been many prosperous periods in the vast history of our country, such as the reign of Han Wenjing, the reign of Tang Kaiyuan, and the reign of Ming Renxian. However, if there are also prosperous periods, there will also be chaotic periods. You here mainly attributes the chaotic times in history to the following periods. The first period is naturally the Spring and Autumn and Warring States period, 770.221 BC, when the customs and music collapsed, various countries attacked and attacked each other, the prestige of the Zhou royal family was destroyed, and the people suffered from war. It was not until Emperor Qin Shi Huang unified the sky that this chaotic era ended. The second one is the Wei, Jin, Southern and Northern dynasties, which can be divided into two time periods. The first was the Sixteen Kingdoms of the Two Jin Dynasties, and the second was the period of confrontation between the Southern and Northern Dynasties. During this period, many people actually heard of it to some extent, and there were even many marketing accounts trying to deceive people by saying that the Wei, Jin, Southern and Northern Dynasties were absurd and beautiful, that boys could be with boys, and that girls could also go to battle and kill enemies. I sneered at this, it's just a bunch of nonsense. The Sixteen Kingdoms, 304.439, and the Southern and Northern Dynasties, 420.589, which lasted for 285 years of war and turmoil, I would like to consider them as the first chaotic era in ancient China. Before the Sixteen Kingdoms, during the nearly sixteen years of 291.306, the famous Eight Kings Rebellion broke out in the Western Jin Dynasty. The kings of the Sima family attacked each other, and after singing, I appeared. As the Eight Kings Rebellion came to an end, the Sixteen Kingdoms officially appeared, which can be said to be a series of struggles for power and profit among the powerful, but the people suffered deeply from it. The most well-known one is the Two-Legged Sheep, which is supported by two historical materials from the Book of Jin. Firstly, after the Hundred Coils of the Jin Dynasty, the wild wine and lust, arrogance and recklessness, sometimes wandering in the fields, entering by hanging pipes or leaving the palace officials' homes at night, indulging in sexual activity with their wives and concubines. Those who dress up the beautiful and elegant palace people, behead and wash their blood, place them on a plate, and pass them on to the public. Additionally, the various nuns, i.e. nuns, inside the palace are also known as the two-legged sheep, those who have beauty will be defiled and killed, and will be cooked with beef and mutton for consumption. They will also be given left and right to taste it. This paragraph is about the record of later Zhao Shishan. Tu Deng, who replaced Wei Ping, then specifically commanded the expedition. At that time, the people were suffering from drought and hunger, and the roads were hidden and facing each other. Deng fought and killed thieves in every battle, named, cooked food, and said to the soldiers, if you fight in the morning, you will be full of meat at night. Why worry about hunger? The soldiers followed suit, devouring dead human flesh and being full and healthy enough to fight. Upon hearing this, Yao Chang urgently summoned Shu Od and said, if you do not come, you will be eaten up by Fu Deng. This passage is about the record of Fu Deng in the pre-Qin period. As for the claims made by many marketing accounts that men were with men and women were dressed in military uniforms to fight against enemies, I believe that in the context of the five barbarians, Xiongnu, Xianbei, Jia, Di, Chang, at that time, this situation occurred because most of the men died in the war. Taking the North as an example, the Han people in the North were almost completely slaughtered, most of the remaining northern Han people migrated south to seek refuge with the eastern Jin dynasty in a remote corner. Of course, in this situation, there were also saviors who emerged, 
and that was the former Liang regime established by the descendants of Han Zhanggui, the governor of Liangzhou in the Western Jin dynasty, which became the pure land of many Han people at that time. In Yu's opinion, this chaotic era could have been less prolonged. Before the Sui dynasty, there was actually an opportunity for unification, and this opportunity was the Battle of Feishui, which was the pre-Qin campaign against Eastern Jin. At that time, the pre-Qin had already unified the north, facing the north and south of Eastern Jin. In terms of overall national strength, the pre-Qin was far superior to Eastern Jin. From the perspective of the relationship between monarchs and officials, the situation in the pre-Qin was much better than that of Eastern Jin, but the only thing is that in terms of ethnic conflicts, the situation in the Eastern Jin dynasty is much better than that in the former Qin dynasty. In addition, as a monarch, Fu Jian was eager to eliminate the Eastern Jin dynasty and unify the world, and did not listen to the advice of his courtiers, ultimately leading to a major defeat in the Battle of Feishui and the ultimate downfall of former Qin. Many people may think that at that time, former Qin was unified in the north and its strength was not weak, but why was it destroyed eleven years after the failure of the Battle of Feishui? Even if the War of Annihilation fails, it will not lead to one's own destruction, will it? I believe that there were two main reasons why former Qin quickly perished after the failure of the Battle of Feishui. The first was the issue of ethnic conflicts mentioned earlier, and the second was the internal power struggle within former Qin. The third one is the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms, 907.979. Although the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms can also be compared to the chaotic period of the Southern and Northern Dynasties, it has one thing better than the Southern and Northern Dynasties, which is that its time is shorter. Although the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms were chaotic, they only existed for 72 years. If they continued for nearly 300 years, it would probably be another huge catastrophe. The last one is the period of the Republic of China in modern times. From the abdication of Emperor Xiantong of the Qing dynasty in 1912 to the establishment of the People's Republic of China in 1949, during this 37-year turbulent era, there were also many marketing accounts promoting how romantic the love of the Republic of China was. However, in reality, those who knew a little about modern history knew that during the Republic of China period, wars and natural disasters continued and the common people suffered unbearable hardships and sold their children. This is the most real situation. My opinion on it is, the Republic of China was the romance of a few upper-class people, but it was a disaster for the ordinary working masses. The remaining books are based on the perspective of the sixteen kingdoms of the two Jin dynasties and the former Qin dynasty, to see if it is possible to reunify the world. Note. This novel mainly refers to Chui Hong's Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms of the Northern Wei Dynasty, and other related historical materials and works will also be referenced, and the timeline may be modified from the original history. Record Historian in May of the Year Guimao Chapter 1 Conquering the Rebel Crown Prince's Life in Danger You are listening at NovelFull.audio In October of the Fourth Year of the Huangshu Era, 354 AD, after autumn, there was a hint of desolation in the city of Chang'an, but at this time, the atmosphere in the Crown Prince's East Palace was heavy and solemn. The exquisitely dressed Empress Chang was anxiously walking around outside the East Palace, occasionally looking inside, as if waiting for someone to come out. And the Crown Princess Chiangshu, who was following her, comforted her aunt by saying, Auntie, don't worry too much. My cousin will definitely be safe this time. On the other side, the crown prince's concubine Yuan also agreed, Mother, don't worry. Your highness is strong and only slightly injured this time. Besides, there is also a crown doctor present. I think it will not be long before your highness recovers. After listening to the comforting words of the two daughter in law, Empress Chang's frown slightly relaxed and she said, Yes, yes, Chang Outer will definitely be fine. But for some reason, she felt extremely uneasy inside. At this moment, with a squeak, three imperial physicians walked out of the East Palace. The chief physician had already turned grey, 
and Empress Chang and the others quickly walked over. Dr. Zhang, how is China's condition? Before approaching, Empress Chang eagerly asked the gray-haired physician. Dr. Zhang was about to answer when a sharp voice suddenly came from behind Empress Chang and the other three. Your Majesty, here you are. A few people quickly turned around and looked in the direction of the sound, only to see Fu Jian, dressed in a dragon robe, walking towards them. As Fu Jian approached, several people bowed to him one after another and said, My concubine, minister, please see your majesty. Fu Jian waved his hand and said, Let's get flat. Then he walked over to his wife and looked at her with a worried expression on her face. Fu Jian lightly patted her soft pussy and silently comforted her. He then asked the three of them, How is it? How is the crown prince's situation? With a plop sound, the three of Zhang Taiyi and his wife immediately knelt down and said, I inform your majesty and empress that I am incompetent. The crown prince. His highness, I'm afraid. Time is running out. After Zhang Taiyi finished speaking, he realized that the cold sweat had already soaked his back. My poor child. Empress Chang burst into tears and buried her head in her husband's arms. Fu Jian's face was also ugly, but he still didn't give up. He asked Dr. Zhang again, is there really no other way? If you need any medicinal herbs, just speak up. As long as they can cure the crown prince, I can send someone to search for them. Dr. Zhang immediately cowed out and said, Your Majesty, I am incompetent. I have committed the death penalty. Your Highness, the Crown Prince, was already injured by an arrow. Not long ago, he personally led troops to defeat the Chiao bandits and stabilize the pass. Now that the arrow injury has recurred, it is likely that the Bien K Hua Tua will be reincarnated. Dr. Zhang didn't say his last words but everyone present already knew what he was going to say next. Fu Jian's eyes also slightly moistened, and his voice couldn't help but become choked. All right, everyone, please step down first. The three of Dr. Zhang were granted amnesty and quickly kowtowed and left. At this moment, Empress Chang had already turned into tears. Fu Jian looked at his wife with a complicated mood and said, Do you want to go in and take a look? Empress Chang choked and nodded. Quickly, Fu Jian and Empress Chang and their wife walked into the East Palace. As soon as they entered, a strong smell of medicine hit their faces. When they arrived at the bedside, they saw the Crown Prince Fu Chang, who was in a coma at the moment. Fu Chang's face was extremely pale, almost devoid of blood, and his lips were also slightly white. As they watched their son turn into this, both the husband and wife were heartbroken. Empress Chang even walked over to the bed and squatted down, then gently pulled out her son's hand from under the blanket to hold it. Feeling her son's gradually cold hand, Empress Chang burst into tears and said, My son. Wake up and look at mom. Mom is here, Chang Er, open your eyes and look at mom. Fu Jian stood behind Empress Chang, tears streaming uncontrollably from his eyes. He reached out to wipe away the tears, but his gaze became blurred. At this moment, he repeatedly questioned the heavens in his heart. Not long ago, he had just taken away his only younger brother, and now even his eldest son is not spared. After a while, Empress Chang was crying uncontrollably. Fu Jian walked forward to help his wife calm down while comforting her, let Chang'e rest first. I have already sent someone to search for a famous doctor. I believe it won't be long before we find a divine doctor who can save Chang'e. Empress Chang cried and pounded Fu Jian's chest, saying, Divine doctor. Divine doctor. But how long can Chang'e hold on now? It's all your fault. Chang'e just returned from Tongguan and was injured by an arrow, but his injuries haven't fully healed yet. So you asked him to lead troops to eliminate Xiao Bing. Is it not enough to break away King now? Do you still want to put Chang'e inside? Fu Xiong, the King of Wei, was his own younger brother. When the four brothers were first in Shi Zhao, they tried every means possible to kill his two brothers because the tyrant Shi who was afraid of his father and son. 
If it weren't for his cleverness and pleasing sure whose father and son, he would probably have followed the footsteps of the two brothers. Since then, during the period when he and his younger brother were hostages, they have relied on each other. Now that his wife speaks without hesitation, he also knows that his wife would say so because of his son's situation. Therefore, he patiently comforted his wife, believe me, Chang'er will be safe and sound. Now Chang'er needs to rest. Let's go out first. I'll have someone stay here and notify you as soon as Chang'er wakes up, okay Empress Chang also knew that her son was going to rest now, so she put her son's hand back under the blanket and followed her husband out. Outside, Chang Xu and Yuan also walked over and said, Father, Mother. Sure, you've been working hard to take care of Chang'e these days. You should also go and rest, Fu Jian said to Chang Xu. Chang Xu shook her head and said, Father, I am his wife and he is my husband. It is only natural for me to take care of him. How can we talk about hard work? But it is the Empress Mother who has been worried about her cousin these days and has no appetite for tea or food. It is better for Father to take good care of Empress Mother. We can stay here to take care of my cousin. If my cousin wakes up, I will immediately send someone to inform Father and Empress Mother. Good child, I have worked hard for you. Fu Jian saw this and left several eunuchs to follow Chang Xu and Yuan in the East Palace to take care of Fu Chang. Then he prepared to leave with his wife. Empress Chang said to her husband, I won't leave. I want to stay here and accompany Chang'er. Fu Jian felt a headache for a while and said, You've been worried for several days now. We have Shuer and her taking care of you here. You should go rest first and come back when you're well rested. It's not too late. Chang Shu also stepped forward to comfort her aunt, Auntie, you can rest assured. There are me and sister you here to take care of my cousin. Please go back with your uncle to rest for a while. If my cousin wakes up, I will come and tell you immediately, okay? Empress Chang, upon seeing this, had no choice but to agree, sure, don't tire you out too. If Chang Ara wakes up, you can arrange for a eunuch to report to me. Well, auntie, let's go rest first. Chang Shu nodded. When Fu Jian and Empress Chang left, Chang Shu and Yuan sat down in a nearby pavilion. Yuan looked at Chang Shu with some concern and said, Sister, His Highness the Crown Prince really. Chang Shu's heart was also in turmoil at this moment. She said to Yuan, Your Highness, the Crown Prince will definitely be fine. Don't think recklessly. Don't forget, we are both members of His Highness's family now, and the only one we can rely on now is His Highness. I think you should be clear about this. Yuan suddenly fell silent. She came from the Feng Yiyu family and was the granddaughter of the founding hero of the great Qin dynasty, Taishi, Lushang Shushi, and Guangning County Gongyuzhen. She had only been married to the crown prince Fu Chang for a year, but Chang Shu's words reminded her that no matter how prominent her family was, the only person she could rely on now was the crown prince Fu Chang. She relied on her family's prominence to become the crown prince's concubine, and she also wanted to bring benefits to the family. If the crown prince really had any accidents, she would be of no use to the family. It's just her abandoned son. Thinking of this, Yuan couldn't help but start praying sincerely in her heart, hoping that the crown prince would recover soon. At this moment, Chang Shu instinctively clenched her clothes tightly, and her mind flashed with various events that had happened before. Her father, Dr. Guanlu Qianping, was the younger brother of the current empress, and she had been childhood friends with her cousin. Therefore, when her cousin was sixteen years old, they got married, and now it has been a full five years. Due to her background and experience, Chang Shu thought of many things that Yuan had not thought of. According to the words of today's imperial physician, her cousin was probably more or less unlucky this time. Thinking of this, Chang Shu's heart began to ache. She thought about how brave and skilled her cousin was in battle, with both intelligence and courage. He defeated the army of Jin General Huan Wen in Tongwan, but now he is lying unconscious in bed. What a cold and thin heaven! 
Moreover, my cousin has been the crown prince for four years, and he also has his own wings and prestige among the courtiers. If something really happens now, the foundation of the Qin dynasty will also be shaken. A crown prince's position is enough to cause a huge sensation. Her aunt only has three sons in total, and her second cousin, Prince Fuxing of Huainan, is now nineteen years old. Although Fuxing is brave in battle and powerful, he is not liked by his aunt because he was born blind, making his personality cruel and violent. My aunt's favorite is the young cousin, Prince Fuliu of Jin, who is only fifteen years old. Therefore, Chang Xu dared to speculate that if her cousin really had an accident, her uncle would definitely have to re-establish the crown prince. Although there were many sons, there were only these three cousins as the legitimate son. Therefore, according to the order of seniority, the crown prince's position should be inherited by the second cousin. However, Chang Xu was very familiar with her aunt's temperament. Among the three cousins, if they were to be liked by her aunt, they would definitely be the younger cousin, the younger cousin, and the second cousin. Therefore, at that time, the aunt was likely to suggest that her uncle make the younger cousin the crown prince, but this would bury the conflict between the second cousin and the younger cousin. And this will probably be the beginning of another catastrophe. Thinking of this, Chang Shu couldn't help but silently sigh in her heart, heaven's mercy, let my cousin get better quickly. If possible, I am willing to use my life to replace my cousin's life, only hoping that he can be safe. Note. 1. In history, Fu Chang passed away in October of the fourth year of the reign of Emperor Shi, but due to being the protagonist of this book, there will be some changes. According to the record of Qin Lu Tu in Volume 34 of the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms. In the fourth year of the reign of Emperor Shi, Crown Prince Chang refused Huan Wen and was hit by a falling arrow. In the winter of October, Chang passed away and was posthumously named Xian Ai. 2. The reason why the crown princess was designated as Chang Shu was mainly based on the reference of Fu Jian and Empress Go, because Empress Go came from the family of Fu Jian's mother and was arranged by Empress Go, who should be Fu Jian's cousin. Therefore, Fu Chang's crown princess was designated as Chang Shu from her mother's family. Some readers who are familiar with history should know that in history, Emperors like Emperor Wu of Han initially married his cousin Chen Ajiao as empress. In ancient times, close relatives such as cousins and younger siblings were not uncommon. Firstly, it was for the purpose of increasing kinship, and secondly, there were also disputes over rights and interests in some marriages. In addition to same-sex cousin marriages, there were also representative marriages. For example, Emperor Cheng of Han and Empress Su, Empress Su was the cousin of Emperor Cheng of Han. We hope readers can understand. 3. Originally, there was a saying in Yuan's place that auspicious people have their own destiny. However, upon investigation, it was discovered that these proverbs only appeared after the Sixteen Kingdoms period. In order to keep up with history, they had to be discarded. In this book, some common sayings may be discarded in character communication, and only those from the Sixteen Kingdoms period and before will be used. We hope for your understanding. Chapter 2 Destiny Encounters the North and South Do for the First Time You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Ah! Uh. Fu Chang woke up from the darkness in a daze. At this moment, he seemed to have just woken up, his head was groggy, and it took about half a quarter of an hour for him to adjust. Someone. Fu Chang shouted out of the curtain, but the surroundings were extremely quiet, and only his own breathing could be heard in the air. Fu Chang didn't know what had happened, so he shouted again, but still no one answered him. At this moment, he looked around and realized that he was in the East Palace. Apart from the dim lights, there was nothing wrong around him. He couldn't figure out where the palace maids and eunuchs who were supposed to be waiting by his side had gone. He slowly sat up from the bed and placed the pillow behind him, leaning against the head of the bed. At this moment, Fu Chang had already recalled what had happened before his coma. He lifted the blanket, untied his clothes, and the wounds on his chest and abdomen had scabbed, 
and he couldn't feel the pain of the wounds at the moment. Ha, Fu Chang let out a heavy breath, then put on his shoes and put on his coat to go out and see what had happened. At this moment, the situation in the East Palace gave him an indescribable and oppressive strange feeling. As he walked to the door, Fu Chang reached out and pushed it open directly, but the next scene in front of him shocked him greatly. With a squeak sound, the heavy gate was pushed open by Fu Chang, and a dazzling sunlight suddenly shone down. The piercing Fu Chang couldn't open his eyes for a moment. When he regained his senses, he looked ahead and was shocked. There was no trace of the palace, and looking around, it was all white and vast, as if he were in a fairyland. Fu Chang was a bit frightened and uncertain. He rubbed his eyes hard and then quickly looked behind him. Behind him was still his own East Palace, but why did this outside become such a scene? Fu Chang turned around and took his sword. He first poked out one foot and stepped on it. After confirming that he had not stepped out, Fu Chang walked out and began shouting loudly, Mother! Father! Where are you? But after shouting several times in a row, no one answered him. The surroundings were already desolate. After thinking for a moment, Fu Chang decided to walk forward and first see what kind of environment he was currently in. I don't know how long it took, but Fu Chang finally saw a big tree. From a distance, there seemed to be a figure under the tree. Fu Chang was overjoyed in his heart, but he still walked cautiously towards the direction of the tree. After Fu Chang arrived at the bottom of the tree, he realized that there were two old men playing chess. Sitting to the north was a blue-faced old man in white, giving a sense of severity, while sitting to the south was a red-faced old man in black, giving a sense of kindness. Fu Chang felt an indescribable strangeness, but he remained calm and then bowed to the two elderly men with his fists clasped, saying, Young Fu Chang has seen the two father dot in dot law. However, these two elderly men seemed to have not heard Fu Chang's words and were still playing chess there. Seeing this, Fu Chang had to stand up and watch from behind the red-faced old man. Finally, about an hour had passed before the game between the two old men came to an end. The old man with a blue face narrowly lost to the old man with a red face. At this moment, he also noticed Fu Chang standing behind his companion and shouted angrily, Why are you here, kid? Fu Chang quickly bowed again and said, I have seen the two father dot in dot law, young Fu Chang. Fu Chang. You said your name is Fu Chang. The old man with a red face suddenly looked at Fu Chang and asked. Well, the younger generation is Fu Chang, Fu Chang nodded and answered. Are you the son of Fu Jian, Fu Jian's original name, the red-faced old man continued to inquire. I'm the younger generation, but I don't know who the two seniors are. Fu Chang was curious about these two elders knowing their father's name taboos. Unexpectedly, the old man with a red face did not answer Fu Chang's question. Instead, he looked at the old man with a blue face across from him and chuckled, Ha ha ha, this is fate. Do you still want to play another game with me? Humph, the old man with a blue face snorted coldly, and then quickly disappeared from the sight of Fu Chang and the old man with a red face with a flick of his sleeve. Fu Chang was surprised to see this scene, and he pointed to the position where the old man with a blue face had just sat, so surprised that he couldn't speak. He. He. Ha ha ha, don't worry, don't worry. The old man with a red face smiled and gestured for Fu Chang to sit where the old man with a blue face was sitting. When Fu Chang sat down, the old man with a red face waved his big hand at the chessboard and said, Wait and see. Immediately after, the chessboard, which was originally full of chess pieces, became illusory. Soon, Fu Chang could not see the chess pieces on top, and a picture appeared on the chessboard. Fu Chang recognized it as his own eastern palace at a glance, and suddenly a scream came from inside. The Crown Prince the crown prince has passed away. What's going on here? I, I'm still okay, isn't it? Fu Chang's eyes widened, he didn't know what was going on. He was clearly still here. Why? 
why did he die? He looked anxiously at the old man with a red face, hoping that he could tell him what had happened. However, the old man with a red face smiled faintly and made a silent gesture, indicating that he continued to look down. Fu Chang suppressed many doubts in his heart and continued to look. Soon, the scene changed. He saw his father, emperor, and mother, lying in a cold coffin. Then, his father, emperor, mournfully announced his passing to the court and the public, and posthumously honored him as the mourning crown prince. Fu Chang became anxious and looked at the old man with a red face in a somewhat flustered manner. Senior. Senior. What's going on here? Fu Chang, you should finish reading these first before speaking, the old man with a red face replied lightly. Fu Chang's face was full of worry and panic, but currently he can only follow the requirements of this red-faced old man. Subsequently, the figures of Empress Chang and Fu Jian appeared on the screen, Husband, Chang Er is no longer here. The country cannot be without a crown prince for a day. We should appoint a crown prince earlier. Fu Jian glanced at his wife and said, What do you mean by that? Empress Chang immediately said, Luer has a respectful and filial nature. How about making Luer the crown prince? Fu Jian seemed to have anticipated his wife's answer a long time ago, and his face sank slightly. So what should you do if you call him Shinger? Empress Chang answered without hesitation, Aren't all the children born now the king of Huainan? Fu Jian sneered and said, Are you too biased towards Lu Er? Having a son is also your son. Since ancient times, this throne has been established with a legitimate heir, but without a legitimate heir, Chang Er is no longer here. Having a son is the second legitimate son, third in the preface, so he should be appointed as the crown prince. Fu Jian was somewhat dissatisfied with his wife's favoritism. He couldn't understand that Fu Sheng and Fu Lu were both her sons, and because Fu Sheng was born with one eye, he couldn't receive her love. But Empress Chang wanted to defend herself, but was interrupted by Fu Jian. You know, my original surname was Pu. My father changed his surname to Fu in response to the prophecy that Chao Fu should be proclaimed king. Do you still know that there is a prophecy that says, three sheep and five eyes? Empress Chang was taken aback for a moment, and naturally knew these two prophecies. Does this have anything to do with making Luer the crown prince? Fu Jian began patiently explaining to his wife, three sheep symbolize three generations of my Fu family, but each sheep has two eyes, so it should be six eyes. How could it be that one eye was missing? This prophecy happened to apply to giving birth. Do you understand now? After hearing this, Empress Chang immediately understood her husband's intention. She knew that she might not be able to persuade her husband to make his young son the crown prince. And Fu Jian continued to say, Do you remember that Shenger, who was blind in one eye, was a piece of flesh that fell from you? Do you know that Shenger won't be the next Duke of Zhengzhuang? The last sentence immediately woke up Empress Chang, because during the spring and autumn period, Duke Zhuang of Zheng had difficulty giving birth to his mother Wu Jiang. Wu Jiang was frightened and named him Wu Sheng, and he despised him. Later, Wu Jiang favored his youngest son Duan even more, and repeatedly requested his husband Zheng Wu to become the crown prince. However, Duke Wu of Zheng did not agree. Until later, Wu Jiang still wanted to help his younger son seize the throne, but his eldest son caught him all, causing his younger son Duan to flee to another country and die in a foreign land. Moreover, without the advice of Ying Kaoshu, Zheng Zhuang's mother and son would probably never see each other again in their lifetime. And she also understood that her husband's words had three meanings in total. The first layer was that he had decided to appoint his second son, Fu Sheng, as the crown prince. The second layer was a warning to her that if he continued to favor his young son like this, it might lead to a recurrence of the relationship between Jing Zhuang and his mother and son. The last layer was to tell her that she could guarantee that Fu Sheng would not become a generation of male leaders like Jing Zhuang. Thinking of this, Empress Chang hung her head and said nothing more. Looking at this scene, 
Fu Chang felt both angry and amused. His mother's neglect of his younger brother made him a little angry. He had always known about his mother's doting on his younger brother and not liking his younger brother. Therefore, he had been taking care of his younger brother most of the time since childhood. He laughed at his father and grandfather's obsession with prophecies. He didn't believe in those prophecies anyway. In his opinion, prophecies were all deceiving people. Take the pre-Han book, i.e. the book of Han, that he had read. After seeing Wang Mang's regency, A.I. Zhang secretly made two copper chambers, one of which read, The Heavenly Emperor. The Golden Chamber Diagram of the Imperial Seal, and the other inscription reads, The Red Emperor's Imperial Seal was passed down to the Emperor's Golden Strategy Book. The Golden Strategy Book clearly states that Han Gaozu Lu Bang wanted to pass on the throne to Wang Mang, and the Empress Dowager should honor the Mandate of Heaven to bestow the throne upon Wang Mang. However, as a result, Wang Mang's new dynasty was overthrown by Emperor Guanwu Lu Xiu less than 20 years ago. If these prophecies were effective, how could Wang Mang die and the country be destroyed? So since then, Fu Chang has not believed any of these prophecies. But he remembered what had happened since he woke up, and there was a vague speculation in his heart that he might really not be in this world anymore. Note. 1. Fu Jian, originally named Fu Bei with the courtesy name Jian Yi, referred to as Shi Jian in the Book of Wei, was renamed Fu Jian to avoid the taboo of Zhang Bei, the grandfather of Emperor Shi Hu of later Zhao. Fu Jian is the son of Fu Hong, the leader of the Di ethnic group. At first, her mother Jiang dreamed of a big bear and became pregnant. According to the second record of the Qin dynasty in volume 34 of the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms, Fu Jian, with the courtesy name Jianya, was the third son of Hong. At first, the mother Jiang had a dream of becoming pregnant with a strong sense of pregnancy. On the night of her birth, the Chao family of Hong Yumeng referred to Jian and said, It is a prosperous family, and I can give it my name. So the name was Ben, with the courtesy name Shi Jian, and later changed to Yen. The Chao family here refers to Fu Jian, the Di king who defected to Shu Han in the fourth year of Qinglong, 236, as recorded in the records of the Three Kingdoms. In the thirteenth chapter of the Yellow Li Lu Ma Wang Zhang Zhuan in the Book of Shu in the records of the Three Kingdoms, it is recorded that, in the fourteenth year, Fu Jian, the prince of Wu, surrendered and sent General Zhang Wei to welcome him. However, the deadline was not yet met, and General Jiang Wan deeply thought of it. Yi Ping said, Fu Jian asked for an additional payment, and there will be no other changes. It is known that Jian is cunning, and the barbarians cannot do the same. There will be some deviations, so he will keep his ears. A few days later, when asked, Jian sent 400 households to Wei, and Du Jian came to follow. 2. Empress Chang had three sons, Fu Chang, the first in the sequence, Fu Sheng, the third in the sequence, and Fu Lu, the eighth in the sequence. Fu Jian's second son, Fu Liang, was not born to Empress Chang. Before Fu Liang appeared, Fu Chang temporarily referred to Fu Sheng as his second younger brother, the second younger brother of the same mother. After Fu Liang appeared, he would address him according to the sequence. 3. According to the third record of the Qin dynasty in the spring and autumn annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms, at the beginning, Jian's eldest son Chang died, and his mother Chang intended her younger son Lu. Jian prophesied that there were three sheep and five eyes, so he was appointed as the crown prince. Chapter 3 Obtaining Immortal Assistance and Getting a First Look at Past Life Events you are listening at NovelFull.audio. Quickly arriving in June of the fifth year of the reign of Emperor Shi, Fu Chang saw that his father was completely ill. Seeing this, Fu Chang's tears couldn't help but blur his eyes. In just one year, he and his fourth uncle passed away one after another. His father was overworked in national politics, and he couldn't bear such a blow to become so sick. Fu Jian seemed to know that his time was running out, so he summoned the crown prince Fu Sheng as a dying confession. However, at this time, Fu Jing, 
who had made outstanding contributions and often acted independently, launched a coup and wanted to kill Fu Sheng for independence. Fu Chong was stunned. Fu Jing was the eldest son of his second uncle and his cousin, who had made great contributions in the process of founding the country and had a good relationship with him. But now he rebelled, which surprised Fu Chang very much. Soon, Fu Jing's rebellion was suppressed and he was killed by Fu Chang. To execute healthily. Due to the lack of foundation before Fu Sheng, Fu Jian arranged for the Grand Tutor Yu Zun, the Prime Minister Lei Weier, the Grand Tutor Mao Gui, the Sikong Wang Chui, the Minister of State Liang Lang, the Left Minister Liang An, the Right Minister Duan Chun, and the Minister of Personnel Xian Lao to serve as auxiliary ministers in order for his son to ascend to the throne smoothly, and also to prevent the recurrence of Fu Jing's affairs. And Fu Chang clearly saw that his father was still instructing his younger brother in the final moments. If the six barbarian chieftains and the ministers in power do not follow your orders, then they should be immediately removed. Fu Chang was deeply saddened to see this scene, as both his grandfather and father had once referred to the Chanyu and appointed the Di chieftain Mao Gui as the deputy prime minister. It was not until his father officially proclaimed himself emperor that because the emperor was the ruler of the world, Shan Yu unified the hundred barbarians, which was not suitable for the emperor to lead. Therefore, Fu Chang gave himself the name de Chanyu. During this period, the situation was turbulent, and most of it was related to the betrayal of the six barbarian chieftains. Grandfather and father preserved their strength as the six barbarian chieftains accumulated strength, and then fought back to Guangzhou. Therefore, Fu Chang felt that the father had always been. I kept an extra eye on these people. Later, he watched as his father's emperor passed away and his second brother ascended to the throne and changed his name to Shouguang. However, what followed was a big eye-opening for Fu Chang. Those courtiers dared to mock his second brother's disability, and Fu Chang felt both heartbroken and angry. His second brother, who was blind in one eye, had not received the care of his mother since childhood, and even other members of his family, including his grandfather, did not like him. Fu Chang also knew that his grandfather had once had the idea of wanting to kill his second brother. It was said that if fourth uncle had pleaded with his second brother in front of his grandfather and father, he would have been killed by his grandfather long ago. Therefore, Fu Chang knew that his younger brother had extremely strong self-esteem. What infuriated Fu Chang the most was that their uncle Chang Ping actually wrote a letter to his second younger brother, saying, Take care of the Yuan dynasty, love the courtesan, abandon the suspicion of Xianjia, contain the faults of the mountains, remove the power of autumn frost, and let the three springs shine. Seeing this, Fu Chang laughed back in anger. Isn't this to make his second younger brother a vegetarian and listen to the attacks and insults of the ministers? Suddenly, a hint of premonition flashed in Fu Chang's heart. As expected, he saw his second brother kill eight auxiliary ministers on various charges and exterminate them all, and his concubine Yuan was executed here. But Fu Chang believed that Lei Weier and Liang and deserved to die, because his perspective clearly saw that the two had secretly received a letter from the Jin minister In Hao, asking them to kill their father, promising them to guard the Guangzhong area. In his view, if there was suspicion of colluding with the enemy, it was necessary to die. Moreover, Liang An was the father of his second brother, Empress Liang, Mao Gui was Empress Liang's uncle, and Liang Lang was of the same family as Liang An, so it was inevitable that they would be implicated. Later, Fu Chang saw that Fu Xingren had chiseled and killed his uncle Qiangping. Seeing this, Fu Chang couldn't help but feel sad. Although his uncle didn't like his second brother, in his opinion, his second brother's killing of his uncle was a form of public revenge. As expected, his cousin Xiangxu also hanged herself after learning of his father's death, and his mother became worried and fell ill after learning about his uncle's murder, and soon passed away. Seeing this, Fu Chang really wanted to beat up his younger brother and kill eight ministers who cared about their lives. He didn't care, but he couldn't accept throwing the butcher's knife at his own family. Subsequently, in the third year of Shouguang, the son of the uncle, Prince Guangping Fu Huangmei, rebelled and wanted to overthrow his second brother. 
However, the situation was leaked, and he was preemptively taken by his second brother. Fu Huangmei was killed and exterminated. Fu Chang suddenly faintly felt that there might be more people going to cause trouble in the future. As expected, his cousin Fu Fa and Fu Jian bribed the palace guards to lead troops into the palace and killed his second brother. Seeing this, Fu Chang could no longer resist. He gasped sharply and looked at the old man with a red face, Senior, tell me what these really mean. But the old man with a red face seemed to be asleep, closing his eyes and not answering Fu Chang's question. At this moment, the picture on the chessboard changed again, and Fu Chang quickly looked over. He saw that Fu Jian and his mother were worried about his illegitimate brother Fu Fei's usurpation of power, and they had deceived Fu Fei into the palace and executed him. Seeing this, Fu Chang sneered and said, Jian Tu, Fu Jian's small character, you have such a cruel heart. From Fu Chang's perspective, Fu Fei had nothing to do to Fu Jian, but because he gained popularity, he aroused suspicion from Fu Jian's mother and son and was brutally executed. Looking at the scene on the screen where Fu Jian cried and fainted while his brother was on the brink of execution, Fu Chang couldn't help but marvel at how he had not seen this cousin act so well in the beginning. Then Fu Chang saw the famous Five Gong Rebellion. Firstly, his half-brother, Duke Fu Yu of Huainan, rebelled and was suppressed by Fu Jian, who killed Fu Yu. Secondly, his half-brother, Duke Fu Lu of Jin, joined forces with his brothers, Duke Fu Xu of Wei, Duke Fu Wu of Yan, and his cousin Zhao Gong Fu Shuang, Fu Jian's half-brother, to rebel. As a result, they were suppressed again and all four were killed. Among them, Fu Lu Man Men was even killed by Wang Meng. Seeing this, Fu Chang's whole body trembled with anger, and his two half-brothers were both killed. It can be considered that he was killed by Fu Jian. Fu Chang suppressed the anger in his heart and continued to watch. When he saw that Fu Jian had unified the North by annihilating the Yan state, breaking the Dai state, Tuoba clan, and surrendering the Liang state, his face finally improved. It seems that Jian Tu still has some skills. Surprisingly, our great Qin has unified the North, he said the scene quickly arrived in July of the 11th year of Jianyuan, 375, when Wang Meng, who was the right-hand man of Fu Jian, was critically ill. On his deathbed, Wang Meng held Fu Jian's hand and said, although the Jin dynasty is located in the remote Jiangnan region, it is orthodox in China, and the upper and lower levels are peaceful. After the death of the minister, your majesty must not attempt to destroy the Jin dynasty. The Xianbei and Western Chang tribes, who subdued the nobles, are the enemies of our country and will eventually become a disaster. They should be gradually eradicated to benefit the country. He then passed away from the world. Watching Wang Meng pass away, Fu Chang's heart was filled with mixed feelings. Although he saw Wang Meng kill his younger brother Fu Yu and uncle Chiangda, who was addicted to alcohol and ruthless, and was caught and killed by Wang Meng in the market, it was understandable. Moreover, as a Han Chinese, Wang Meng devoted all his efforts to helping Fu Jian, enabling them to unify the North in the Great Qin Dynasty. It can be said that he devoted himself wholeheartedly. Oh, Fu Chang let out a heavy sigh. Time soon arrived in the 19th year of the Jianyuan era, 383, and Fu Chang clearly saw that during the period after Wang Meng's death, Fu Jian gradually forgot the instructions from the other party on his deathbed and began to build extensively, indulging in a life of extravagance and extravagance. At the same time, he also had the idea of going south to conquer Jin and unify the world. When Fu Jian announced to the courtiers in the court that he was preparing to launch a rebellion and go south to destroy the Jin family, the opposition from the courtiers was widespread. Even Fu Jian's trusted younger brother, Duke Yangping Fu Rong, and his youngest son, Duke Zhongshan Fu Shen, expressed opposition to the expedition against the Jin family, but they were not surprised to receive Fu Jian's reprimand. Seeing this, Fu Chang felt that his cousin had become somewhat arrogant in recent years, and at the same time, he vaguely felt that this time he was really going south to conquer Jin, and it might not be as simple as his cousin thought. 
Amidst numerous objections, Fu Jian still found several voices supporting himself, namely Murong Chui and Yao Chang. After hearing Murong Chui's advice, Fu Jian happily said to him, The only one who can pacify the world with me is you, Ai Ching. He rewarded him with 500 pieces of silk. Subsequently, in July of the same year, Fu Jian issued a general mobilization order. On August 26, Fu Jian appointed Fu Rong as the commander. In. Chief of the Southern Expedition and the vanguard commander, leading a force of 250,000 to advance. This time, he mobilized more than 600,000 soldiers, 270,000 cavalry, and a total force of over 870,000. At the beginning, the attack of the Qin army was unstoppable, and the Jin army retreated step by step. Important towns such as Shouyang and Yuncheng were successively captured, causing an uproar among the Jin dynasty and the public. When Fu Jian learned that everything was going smoothly on the front line, he left a large army in Xiangcheng and arrived at Shouyang with only 8,000 light cavalry day and night. He happily said to Fu Rong, if the Jin people knew that I was coming, they would quickly return south and use the Yangtze River as a defense line to defend. In this way, even if I had a million troops, it would be useless. But now I secretly came to let them not know that I was coming. They took care of the land in the east of the Yangtze River and would fight against our army here. If they were defeated and scattered, they would want to defend the Yangtze River again to block our army. This would be a big deal for me to destroy Jin. You can succeed now. Subsequently, Fu Jian ordered the captured Jin general Zhu Su to persuade Xie Shi and others to surrender, but Fu Jian was unaware that Zhu Su was surrendering. After seeing Xie Shi, Zhu Su immediately told him all about the reality of the Qin army and suggested that he take the lead in attacking while the Qin army had not yet arrived. Seeing this, Fu Chang exclaimed in his heart that something was wrong. Now that the reality of the Qin army was already well known to the Jin army, how could this battle be fought? As expected, Xie Xian ordered Lu Guanji to lead elite troops to launch a surprise attack on Luo Jian. The morale of the Qin army was low and they had no desire to fight. The main general of the Qin army, Liang Cheng, his brother Liang Yun, and the governor of Yang, Wang Yong, were all killed in battle. The governor of Yangzhou, Wang Xian, deputy generals Liang He, Liang Ti, Murong Chu Shi, and others were all captured by the Jin army. In this battle, the Qin army suffered more than 15,000 casualties. Liang Cheng's 50,000 strong army suddenly collapsed, and all the weapons and supplies were obtained by the Jin army. The main force of the Jin army also pursued the victory and advanced by water and land, camping on the east bank of Feishui River with Fu Rong. Confrontation Note 1. The Wugong Rebellion of the former Qin dynasty occurred in 365 AD and 367.368 AD, marking the third survival crisis encountered by the former Qin dynasty, the first was the northern expedition of Huan Wen of the eastern Jin dynasty, and the second was under the rule of Fu Sheng. It was actually two rebellions, the first being Gong and the second being Sigong. From the perspective of the entire incident, it seems to be a condensed version of the Seven Kingdoms Rebellion of the Western Han Dynasty, but its historical popularity is very low. 2. According to the biography of Yin Haochuan in Volume 47 of the Book of Jin, he was a disciple of Shouyang and lured ministers such as Liang En and Lei Weier to kill Jian. He was appointed as Guan Yuren. 3. Fu Jian ranks third with two older brothers both killed by Shi Hu. There are four recorded brothers and sons. Fu Jing, Fu Huangmei, Fu Zhong, and Fu Luo. Among them, Fu Jing, Fu Luo, and Fu Zhong are biological brothers, so they are temporarily designated as the son of Fu Jian's second brother, and Fu Huangmei is temporarily designated as the son of Fu Jian's eldest brother. 4. Among the eight auxiliary ministers, Mao Gui is of the Di ethnic group, Lei Weier is of the Chang ethnic group, Liang Leng comes from the Anding Liang family, Yu Zun comes from the Feng Yu family, Wang Kai comes from the Jingzhao Wang family, Liang An is of the same family as Liang Leng, 
Xian Lao is a Han from Beidi County, and Duan Chun's background is unknown. 5. In Volume 34 of the Annals of the Former Qin, it is recorded that, Jian said during the birth of the crown prince, if the six barbarian chieftains and ministers who hold power do not follow your orders, they should be gradually removed. 6. In the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms, Volume 38 of the pre qin Records, it is recorded that during the Wuwu period of the eighth lunar month, the Grand General of Conquering the South and Yang Ping Gong Rong were dispatched, with Zhang Hao as the Commander-in-Chief of Cavalry, Gao Yang Gong, Fu, as the Pacification General, Yang Cheng as the Guard General, Murong Wei as the Ping Nan General, Murong Chui as the Champion General, Chu Yu Wei Zhong as the Brave Cavalry General, and 250,000 troops as the vanguard. Yao Chang, the governor of Yenzhou, was appointed as the general of Longxiang, overseeing the various military forces in Yiliangzu. Jia Zi was appointed as the commander of the Chang'an army, with over 600,000 soldiers and 270,000 cavalry, covering thousands of miles in front and back, and with flags and drums alternating. Hope, everyone has a million followers. Chapter 4 Huang Liang Dream Fu Qin's Final Fission You are listening at NovelFull.audio Subsequently, Fu Chang saw Fu Jian climb up the city to gaze at Mount Bagong, and even treated the grass and trees on the mountain as the Jin army. He said to Fu Rong, These are strong enemies, how can we say they are weak? This scene made Fu Chang laugh and cry, because he had already seen from these performances that Fu Jian did not have full confidence in destroying Jin. At this moment, his heart had begun to shake. Subsequently, Fu Jian and the crowd discussed whether to agree to the Jin army's decision to cross the river. This proposal was opposed by the vast majority of people, while Fu Rong suggested ambushing cavalry and launching a charge while the Jin army was crossing the river to defeat them in one battle. However, this proposal was rejected by Fu Jian. He wanted to use the advantage of the Qin army's expertise in infantry to annihilate the Jin army in one battle after crossing the river. Fu Chang touched his forehead with his hand, not knowing what to say. He felt that since the defeat of the Qin army in the Battle of Luojian, his cousin had been in a state of no state since the invasion of Jin. Seeing this, Fu Chang couldn't help but think of the story of Song Xiangong's great benevolence and righteousness during the spring and autumn and warring states periods. When fighting against the Chu army, the two armies were also separated by a large river. Song Xiangong agreed to let the Chu army cross the river to determine the outcome. His soldiers requested to cross half of the river and attack, but he refused with the words, benevolence and righteousness. When the Chu army crossed the river and was in formation, he proposed to launch an attack on both sides, which was then rejected by him. Rini refused, and finally, after the Chu army had formed their formation, the two armies clashed and the Song army suffered a great defeat. Now, how similar is Fu Jian seen to that of Duke Xiang of Song? When the Qin army was preparing to retreat, the Jin army made sufficient preparations. At the same time, they asked Xie Shi to lead troops and tightly entangle Zhang Hao, who was known as the enemy of 10,000 people, stationed in Fainan, making him unable to support during the decisive battle. Then, they asked Xie Yan and Huan Yi to lead 8,000 elite soldiers to closely monitor the movements of the Qin army. At this moment, relying on years of sensitivity to war, Fu Chang had already guessed the approximate outcome of the battle, which should be the defeat of the Qin army, then continued to retreat and confront the Jin army. However, the situation that followed was unexpected for Fu Chang. Fu Rong commanded the Qin army to retreat, and Xie Yan and Huan Yi immediately led troops to cross the river. Fu Jian planned to wait for the Jin army to cross the river and force them to carry the water to fight, which gave the Jin army a chance to cross the river safely. As soon as the Jin army vanguard landed, they launched a fierce attack on the Qin army. The Qin army could not resist, and various departments began to become chaotic. Fu Rong personally led his own soldiers to ride and strategize in an attempt to stabilize his position. As a result, his horse was washed down by the chaotic army, 
and Fu Rong was killed on the spot by the rushing Jin army before he could get up from the ground. When the Qin army saw Fu Rong's death, their various departments became even more panicked. Zhu Su took the opportunity to shout the Qin army has been defeated in the rear, causing the Qin army to collapse. The Jin army pursued and defeated the Qin army, recaptured Shouyang, and captured the Qin Huainan prefect Guo Bao. In this battle, the Qin army had countless casualties, and their bodies even blocked the Fei River, making it unable to move. Fu Jian's imperial chariots, ceremonial clothing, military supplies, and more than 100,000 cattle, horses, donkeys, mules, and camels were all captured by the Jin army. Zhu Su and others took the opportunity to return to the Jin camp. And Fu Jian was even more disheveled, with a flowing arrow in his body. He rode alone to seize the road and ran towards Huaibei. The following year, the Jin army launched a full counterattack, defeating the Qin army on all sides and recapturing large areas of lost territory. At this moment, Fu Chang's face was already pale with iron. He never expected the Qin army to be defeated so miserably. He wanted to use his sword to strike Fu Jian. In the Battle of Feishue, the Qin army was severely weakened, and in the following period of time, Fu Chang estimated that the Qin state would not be able to recover. Fu Chang watched as Fu Jian returned to Chang'an to mourn and offer sacrifices to Fu Rong, plead guilty to the imperial temple, grant amnesty to the world, increase the rank of officials by one level, and exempt the families of the deceased soldiers from taxation for generations. He felt that doing these things now seemed to be of no use. As expected, even though Fu Jian did these things, people still felt anxious, and internal turmoil began to erupt. In the Yuanchuan area, Chifu Guoren took the lead in uprising, with a crowd of 100,000. Next was Murong Chui, who was the first to kill Fu Failong who was monitoring him. He then rose up against Qin, and then Murong Hong also rose up against Qin. From then on, the chaos spread from Kanto to Guangzhou. Later, Ao Chang also rose up and proclaimed himself as the Grand General and Great Chanyu, and gained the support of more than 100,000 Xianghu people in Beidi, Huayin, Xinping, Anding and other areas, and teamed up with Murong Hong to attack Fu Jian. Fu Chang felt dizzy and disoriented. In less than a year, the vast empire before him had already begun to disintegrate. After learning the news, Fu Jian was furious and executed Murong Wei and others. In January of the 21st year of Jianyuan, 385, Murong Chong proclaimed himself emperor in Afang city and marched into Chang'an. Fu Jian fought fiercely with Murong Chong in Chang'an city for nine months until he suffered three major defeats in Baitsu, Lishan, and the west of Chang'an city. He believed a prophecy book called Ancient Talisman Chronicles Jia Lu that read, The emperor has produced five generals for a long time, and surprisingly left crown prince Fu Hong to guard Chang'an. He took Lady Zhang, his young son Fu Shen, and three daughters to flee to Wujiang Mountain. At this moment, Fu Chang's heart was already crazy. The prophecy, and also the prophecy, did the Fu family believe in it like this? In his opinion, Fu Jian could completely continue to defend Chang'an. Although the situation is not good now, Fu Jian still has some remaining strength. As long as he withstands this wave of attack, he can create glory again. Once he gives up Chang'an city and runs away, it will cause panic among the military and civilians. Secondly, what if there is an accident when you leave the city? No one can say for sure about these things. However, Fu Hong had no military talent, and at this critical moment, he actually led his mother and wife westward to Xia Bian, and finally surrendered to the Jin family. Murong Chong took Chang'an city and burned, killed, and looted it extensively, turning the bustling city into ruins. On the other hand, after capturing Xinping, Yao Chang learned that Fu Jian had fled to Wujiang Mountain and immediately led troops to pursue him. Eventually, he captured Fu Jian and hanged him in the Xinping Buddhist temple. Mrs. Zhang and Fu Shen committed suicide. Seeing his cousin die, Fu Chang still felt a bit sad in his heart, 
but in his opinion, his cousin was taking the blame for himself. Previously, Wang Meng had persuaded him to kill Murong Chui, Yao Chang, and others. Wang Meng even used a golden sword strategy for this, but still did not ask Fu Jian to kill them. If he had killed them earlier, how could there be today's upheaval? Subsequently, Fu Pai, the illegitimate eldest son of Fu Jian, proclaimed himself emperor in Jinyang, followed by Yang Ding claiming to be the king of Longxi, LV Guang, who returned from the western expedition, claiming to be the duke of Jiuquan and the governor of Liangzhou, and Tuoba Qian claiming to be the prince of Dai. The entire northern region was completely chaotic. However, Fu Pai was defeated by Murong Yong in the Battle of Xiangling, and later killed by the Jin Yang Wei General Feng Ji while planning to attack Luoyang. At this time, only the crown prince Fu Hong fled to the Jin family among Fu Jian's sons, and the rest had already died. So Fu Deng, the descendant of Fu Jian's clan, was crowned emperor by the people. After Fu Deng declared himself emperor, he immediately engaged in a battle with Yao Chang. He knew the principle of victory through mourning. In order to provoke the anger of the Qin army, Fu Deng specially set up a logistics cart with shielding on all sides in the army, inside which he worshipped the deity Fu Jian, with green feathers and a yellow flag to guide him. He selected 300 soldiers to defend him. Before each battle, he would lead his generals to pray to the deity Fu Jian. As a result, he was victorious in every battle. In September of the second year of the Taichu era, 387, Fu Deng advanced to Hukong Fortress, and hundreds of thousands of soldiers returned from the Rong and Xia dynasties, demonstrating great power. When Yao Chang faced off against Fu Deng, he repeatedly suffered defeats and believed that it was Fu Jian's ghost. He ordered the excavation of Fu Jian's tomb, stripped his body naked, wrapped it in thorns, and buried it in soil. Little did he know that this made Fu Deng even more righteous and brave in battle. In the fourth year of the Taichu era, 389 AD, Yao Chang finally discovered the mystery of Fu Deng's selflessness. He followed suit and established Fu Jian as the god in the army, but the result was still that he would be defeated in every battle. In the Battle of Anxiu, he lost more than 25,000 soldiers. Fu Chang felt that he had never seen someone as shameless as Yao Chang in his lifetime. It was fortunate that Fu Jian had high hopes for Yao Chang and often encouraged him. In the scene, Yao Chang, in a fit of anger, destroyed Lord Fu Jian and was determined to fight against Fu Deng with his courage and intelligence. In the Battle of Anding in August, Yao Chang personally led 30,000 elite soldiers to defeat Fu Deng and captured more than 50,000 people, gradually revealing Fu Deng's decadence. Until the eighth year of the Taichu era, 393, internal conflicts broke out in Fu Deng's army. Taking advantage of this good opportunity, Yao Chang ordered Crown Prince Yao Xing to feign an attack on Hukong Fort while personally leading troops to raid Pingliang and plunder Fu Deng's supplies. Fu Deng himself was captured and killed by Yao Xing in July of the ninth year of the Taichu era. Fu Chong, the crown prince of Fu Deng, fled to Huangzhou and ascended to the throne, changing his reign to Yanchu. In October of the same year, he was killed by Chifu Qian Gui. Seeing this, Fu Chang's heart was also very heavy. After the fall of the Great Qin, he passed down six emperors and established the country for 40.4 years. The two generations of the Fu family worked hard and eventually dissipated like a mirror of water and moon. But at this moment, the picture on the chessboard was still changing. Fu Chang sighed and continued to watch. He saw that after the fall of the Qin state established by the Fu family, Yao Chang established a state also known as, later, Qin, and LV Guang, who returned from the Western Expedition, established, later, Liang, Morong Chui established, later, Yan, Morong De also established, southern, Yan, bald haired Wu Gu established, southern, Liang, Chifu Guoran established, western, Qin, Helian Bo established, De, Xia, and so on. The entire northern region was in chaos, and they were originally subordinates or subordinates of the Fu family. At the same time, the southern region was also in chaos. Huan Xian, 
the son of Huan Wan, became independent and established the state of Chu. However, he was soon defeated by a man named Lu Yu. Fu Chang could see that the Jin dynasty was already struggling. He saw Murong Choi vomiting blood in the Kanhipi area and soon passed away. He saw Tuoba Gui being killed by his son in his later years. He also saw Lu Yu capturing and killing Yan Emperor Murong Chao and Qin Emperor Yao Hong, and then deposed the two Jin emperors and established himself as the Song dynasty. In the end, he saw the scene on the chessboard abruptly come to an end after Tuoba Tao's grandson, Tuoba Tao, eliminated Jutsu Mujian who was occupying Liangzhou. The scene gradually faded and slowly returned to the previous chessboard. Fu Chang slowly lifted his head. At this moment, his heart was empty, and the old man with a red face slowly opened his eyes and looked at him with a smile on his face. Note. The incident of Fu Jian gazing at Mount Bagong from the city head is recorded in Volume 38 of the Sixteen Kingdom Spring and Autumn Annals of the former Qin Record 7. Jian and Rong climbed to Shouchuan City and looked at it. They saw Qin Yanjing, the Jin Ministry of War, and the elite soldiers. They also saw the grass and trees on Mount Bagong, all of whom thought they were Jin soldiers. Gu said Rong, this is also a strong enemy. What is weakness? At the same time, this is also the origin of the term grass and trees are all soldiers. Chapter 5 Immortal Guide The Crown Prince's Understanding of the Mysteries You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Fu Chang looked at the old man with a red face and a hint of confusion in his eyes. Senior, I believe what I just saw on the chessboard is what will happen in the future, right? The old man with a red face nodded slightly, and Fu Chang said somewhat disappointed, it seems that the younger generation is no longer in this world. The old man with a red face touched his beard and smiled, Fu Chang, how about I test you a few questions? Fu Chang respectfully replied, of course, senior, even if you ask questions, as long as it is what I know, I promise to speak without hesitation and without hesitation. Okay, let me first ask you this first question. What do you think is the reason for the downfall of the Fu family's Qin state? Fu Chang was slightly taken aback, and after a moment of contemplation, he slowly spoke up, I thought the first point was the failure of the Battle of Feishui to defeat Qin. The second was the fickle villains such as Murong Chui, Yao Chang, and Qi Fu Guoren. If my cousin had listened to Wang Meng's words and killed all these villains earlier, even if I were defeated in Feishui, I wouldn't have immediately disintegrated and collapsed. The old man with a red face continued to ask, the second question is, how do you think Fu Jian treated Wang Meng? Fu Chang immediately answered decisively, in the eyes of the younger generation, my cousin treated Wang Meng extremely well and trusted him greatly. It was with their joint efforts that I, the great Qin, was able to unify the North. The third question, if it were you, who inherited the throne and unified the North, would you go south to destroy Jin? If the younger generation can successfully succeed to the throne and unify the North, I think I will also send troops south to destroy Jin, after all, this unification of the world is a great temptation for every ambitious emperor. The old man with a red face no longer spoke, but instead stared directly at Fu Chang. The scrutinizing gaze made Fu Chang feel uncomfortable all over his body. Just as Fu Chang was about to ask himself why he appeared in this place, the red-faced old man spoke up, let me first analyze the answers to these questions for you. Please teach me, senior. The first question, do you think there are only two reasons for the downfall of your Fu family's Qin parliament? Firstly, your cousin Fu Jian failed in the Battle of Feishui. Secondly, people like Murong Chui and Yao Chang took the opportunity to rebel, ultimately leading to the downfall of your Fu family's Qin state. Well, yes, Fu Chang nodded. But what I want to tell you is that you only see the surface phenomena of things, not the essence of things. Fu Chang had some doubts, why didn't he see the essence of things? The old man with a red face seemed to see Fu Chang's confusion. First of all, Let's talk about your first idea. 
The Battle of Feishue was indeed one of the reasons for the downfall of your Fu family Qin state, but it was not even the most crucial factor. It was just a trigger. In fact, the relationship between the downfall of your Fu family Qin state and the Battle of Feishue is not very significant. Please clarify, Senior. If the internal unity and cohesion of your Fu family in the Qin state were really strong, even if you were defeated in the Battle of Feishue, you wouldn't be able to split apart in a short period of time. In other words, you are not strong enough. Strong. But Senior, my cousin unifies the North. Isn't that strong enough? Not enough, the old man with a red face shook his head and said, the strength you are talking about is only superficial, not true strength. Once this superficial strength encounters some setbacks, it will immediately collapse. Dare to ask Senior, what is true strength? Don't worry, do you still remember In Wei? The younger generation naturally remembers. Of course, Fu Chang remembers In Wei, who appeared in the image as a person who surrendered to Yao Chang during the fall of the Qin state. Later, he was ordered by Yao Chang to persuade Fu Jian to surrender, and Fu Jian even praised him for having the talent of Wang Zuo. However, when he was originally in the Qin state, he was only a small official official. Fu Jian ordered all the officials to be imprisoned and not serve, just because Yin Wei's clan member Yin Qi had surrendered to Yao Xiang, brother of Yao Chang, but he entrusted Yao Chang with a heavy responsibility. Do you think so? Um. I. Fu Chang was momentarily speechless, and the old man with a red face continued, before your Fu family's Qin state, was Shi Zhao, i.e. Later Zhao, strong enough. Was Shi Hu powerful enough. But why couldn't he capture a small Liang state, i.e. former Liang? Why did he fly into ashes after Ran Min raised his arm and exhaled? That's because there were famous generals like Xia Ai in the Liang dynasty, as well as Shi Hu and his group who committed many evil deeds, that's why they did this, Fu Chang immediately replied. The old man with a red face smiled and said, You still only see the surface of things. Let me ask you who established the Liang kingdom. Zhang Shi. What kind of clan is this Zhang Shi? He is Han Chinese. By the way, do you still remember how Han Zhao, formerly known as Zhao, and Shi Zhao treated the Han people since then? Fu Chang was taken aback for a moment. He felt as if something flashed through his mind, but he didn't catch it. Ah. Uh, massacre, even. Even use it as military rations. Yes, so it's not entirely because the soldiers of Liang were brave and skilled in battle, nor because Liang's national strength was stronger than that of Shi Zhao, but because it's not just a struggle between two countries, but a struggle between two ethnic groups. It's truly the end of the line. If the Han people of Liang don't rise up to resist, they will follow the footsteps of the Han people in the central plains and become one of the many undead souls, and the reason why Ran Min can receive a response from thousands of people with just one shout is that, besides being a Han Chinese, he also represents the interests of Han people to a certain extent. Do you understand Fu Chang nodded as if he understood something? The old man with a red face continued, similarly, do you think it was because your cousin Fu Jian was kind hearted and did not kill Morong Chui, Yao Chang, and others, which caused a great disaster and led to the downfall of the Qin state? But have you ever thought that even if Fu Jian killed them, there might still be Yuan Chui and Yuan Chang emerging to continue the rebellion? This is because Morong Chui is a Xianbei person, and Yao Chang is a Chang person, they are not like you are D people. Senior it seems that I understand what you mean. Are you saying that these are not accidental occurrences, but inevitable? And these are not just personal grudges between my cousin, Morong Chui, Yao Chang, and others, but also conflicts between several ethnic groups, right? The old man with a red face finally nodded in satisfaction and said, you can be taught. Also, do you know why the Qin army was defeated in the Battle of Feishui? This is not just due to accidents and incorrect judgments on the battlefield. Is this also related to the contradictions between ethnic groups? Not only that, but at that time, 
your Qin state was constantly conquering, annihilating Liang, defeating Yan, surrendering, and pacifying the Five Gong Rebellion, and so on. The soldiers were already overwhelmed, so most of them were very tired of war at that time. This was the first reason for the failure of the Battle of Feishui, which was morale. Secondly, as you just mentioned, there are also ethnic conflicts here. Although the state of Qin unified the north, the common people under its rule included Han, Di, Xianbei, Jie, Xiongnu, Chang, and so on. Various ethnic groups had conflicts with each other, resulting in uneven people's hearts. If people's hearts were not aligned, they could not be twisted together. On the other hand, in the Jin dynasty, although they were in a corner, but the majority of the Han people under his rule were Han people, of course, these Han people were divided into Han people who were originally in the south and Han people who crossed south in the north, senior, is there any difference between these two? In Fu Chang's view, both are Han Chinese, which means that one originally lived in the north but now has moved to the south, while the other originally lived in the south. I ask you, why do the Han people in the north have to cross south, leave their homes behind, or even abandon their wives and children? What are the factors that cause these? This. This. Suddenly, Fu Chang's mind flashed with the words he had said before. He looked at the old man with a red face in surprise and said, this is because they are almost unable to survive in the north. That's right, after the northern Han people migrated south, they would tell the southern Han people about their painful experiences in the north. The southern Han people were already accustomed to that plain and indifferent life, so when Fu Jian went south to destroy Jin, the northern Han people were afraid of falling into the tiger's mouth again, while the southern Han people were afraid of their originally peaceful life being shattered. Therefore, at this time, they would unite, twist into a rope, and unite to the outside world, which is why another reason why the Qin army was defeated in the Battle of Feishui, so, do you understand now? If Fu Jian had completely eliminated all domestic contradictions before the Battle of Feishui, even if he had weakened them, he wouldn't have ended up like that. Senior, I understand now. This is just like what is said in Xuanzi. The system of kings. The ruler, the boat, the commoners, the water. The water carries the boat, and the water capsizes the boat. The people of all ethnic groups are like this water, and the ruler is like this boat. As long as they receive the support of the people, even if the conditions are difficult and there are many difficulties, they can definitely be overcome. Fu Chang said excitedly, he felt as if he had realized the importance of many things that he had never valued before today. Yes, it doesn't matter whether the Jin family is orthodox or not. The common people actually don't care who is orthodox, but in their view, as long as it is considerate and beneficial to the people, it is orthodox. Although the Jin family may not be as good as your Qin country in other aspects, in terms of national cohesion, your Qin country is not as good as the Jin family. But senior, how should we mediate the conflicts between different ethnic groups when the situation in our Qin state is so complex? The old man with a red face smiled and said, these are things you should consider. Remember, what ordinary people actually want is very simple. Fu Chang looked at the old man with a red face and felt lost in thought. Today, the words of the old man with a red face seemed to open a new door for him. From ancient times to the present, including Fu Chang, the orthodoxy in the consciousness of all rulers has been from top to bottom. Firstly, he proclaimed himself to be ordered by heaven, and secondly, he accepted abdication from the late emperor of the previous dynasty to prove the legitimacy of his throne. However, now Fu Chang has a new understanding of orthodoxy, which is a bottom-dot-up approach, the orthodoxy based on the people, and Fu Chang vaguely believed that only the orthodoxy based on the people is true orthodoxy and can last for a long time. Note. During the reign of Shi Hu, he attacked Xianliang multiple times, but was defeated three times by Xia Ai. He praised him and said, I established the nine provinces with my partial army, but now I am trapped in the Rahan with the strength of the nine provinces. There are no people there, and there is no plan. As for the process of Xia Ai's battle with the later Zhao army, 
it is recorded in both Volume 17 of the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms and Volume 73 of the Four Records of the Former Liang. Chapter 6 Resurrection of the Crown Prince's Soul from Immortal Fate You are listening at NovelFull.audio Let's talk about this second question again. First, why do you think Fu Jian treated Wang Meng extremely well? After pondering for a moment, Fu Chang sorted out his language before speaking. Senior, I'm not afraid of you laughing when I say it. To be honest, my Fu family is just like that to people from other ethnic groups. Back then, the left chief minister Jia Xuanshua, from the Jia family in Wuwei, because he suggested that my father emperor postpone his reign, he was completely executed by my father emperor. However, he has also made great contributions to the entrepreneurial process of my father emperor and his family. I think if he were also a deep person, perhaps my father emperor would not have killed him in the first place. Moreover, after my father emperor officially declared himself emperor, the court officials he was in theft with, such as Mao Gui, Qiangping, Lei Wire, L. V. Palu, and others, were all Di Chang nobles, it can also be seen that my father and emperor do not attach much importance to the Han people, while my cousin highly values Wang Meng. Even if he hunts and kills illegal D nobles, he will not be punished, and even in the end, he will be called to the position of prime minister. Isn't this not good enough for him, huh? The old man with a red face laughed and said, Fu Chang, you are still too young. You need to slowly learn to see the essence of things through surface phenomena. Fu Chang pursed his lips and said, Fu Chang is dull. Please speak frankly, senior. Let me ask you, in the north, which country poses the greatest threat to your Qin state? Of course it's the Yen state of the Murong clan, formerly known as former Yen, Fu Chang said without hesitation. That's right, do you still remember who led the army to destroy Yen state? Fu Chang recalled the scene he had seen on the chessboard before and said, it was. Wang Meng leading his troops to destroy it. Well, do you remember how many people he brought with him? Sixty thousand, senior, is there anything wrong with this? Don't worry, let me analyze it carefully for you. Go Chang destroyed Liang and led 130,000 soldiers, Fu Luo destroyed Dai and led 300,000 soldiers, Fu Pai seized Xiangyang and led 170,000 soldiers. Even if Fu Yit destroyed the small Chiu Qi kingdom, he would still lead 70,000 soldiers. As the biggest opponent of Qin, Yan, not to mention using hundreds of thousands of troops to annihilate it, would require at least tens of thousands of people. But why did Fu Jian only give Wang Meng 60,000 troops? This is not because there was a shortage of troops at that time. Don't forget that Fu Jian personally led a 100,000 strong army to the rear. This. Fu Chang couldn't speak for a moment. The old man with a red face continued, Also, do you remember that Fu Luo suffered from Fu Jian's suspicion? Fu Jian once specifically ordered that Fu Luo not pass through the capital, but why appoint him as the commander of the 300,000 strong army? And there were also two points. Firstly, during the annihilation of Yan, Deng Chang demanded an official position from Wang Meng in front of the battle. After being rejected by Wang Meng, he was displeased and retreated. When the Yan army arrived, Wang Meng sent people to send Deng Chang to battle several times, but he ignored him. It was not until Wang Meng agreed to his request that he went to war, thus greatly defeating the Yan army. Later, Wang Meng reported this matter to Fu Jian, but Fu Jian eventually abandoned it. Secondly, after the Qin army defeated the Yan army, they marched forward with great fanfare and quickly surrounded the city of Yi. The rulers and officials of the Yan state had become turtles in a jar, and Yi city was easily accessible. Wang Meng reported victory to Fu Jian and requested to be granted the right to dispose of his rights. However, the result was that Fu Jian ordered his soldiers to rest and wait for him to come in person before deploying the siege. Do you still think that Fu Jian treated Wang Meng extremely well? Do you still believe him? Um. I. Don't worry, I don't know if you have a detailed count just now. 
Since Fu Jian ascended the throne to the eve of the Battle of Feishui, there have been a total of 25 people holding titles such as envoy, commander, commander, or general, including Fu Lu, Fu Shuang, Wang Meng, Deng Chang, Fu Rong, Fu Luo, Qi Fu Guoren, Fu Ya, Fu Pai, Yao Chang, Fu Hui, Fu Lang, Fu Rui, LV Guang, and so on. Most of them are relatives of the Fu family and the Di clan, while the Han people only. There were Zhang Ping, Wang Meng, and Deng Chang, but after the deaths of Wang Meng and Deng Chang, no Han Chinese held military power in the central government. On the other hand, the positions of Murong Chui, Yao Chang, Murong De, and others in military activities became increasingly important, either as commanders of one side or as commanders of the first army, so, Fu Jian's tilt towards the Han people is not a true tilt, nor is it a true way to ease conflicts between different ethnic groups. The old man with a red face said earnestly, and all of his words aroused Fu Chang's deep reflection. All right, let's talk about the third question. You're right. Unifying the world is a great temptation for every ambitious emperor, but what I want to tell you is to learn to do what needs to be done at the right time, rather than doing something else before it's done. This way, in the end, you will only achieve nothing, and whether it's unity or division, the ultimate suffering will only be limited to. Can you give the common people a peaceful and prosperous era? The old man with a red face finished his last sentence and looked at Fu Chang with bright eyes. Fu Chang looked firmly at the old man with a red face and said, Today, I was enlightened and awakened by the guidance of my senior. I cannot guarantee to the senior whether I can give the people a peaceful and prosperous era. Upon hearing this, a hint of disappointment flashed in the eyes of the old man with a red face, but Fu Chang continued, but the younger generation is willing to spend their entire lives in poverty and do their best to give back a peaceful and prosperous era to the people, so that they can drum up their stomachs and spread rumors of prosperity, and enjoy the joy of peace to the fullest. Okay, okay, okay. The red-faced old man looked at Fu Chang with relief. By the way, I suddenly thought of another thing. Senior, but it doesn't matter. Fu Chang, do you think your death has any impact on the state of Qin? Although Fu Chang knew he was no longer there, when he heard these words, he still felt a bit disappointed. He slowly lowered his head and whispered, young generation. I don't know. The old man with a red face shook his head with a smile and said, kid, don't be so pessimistic. I told you that your sudden death was an important reason for the internal strife within the Qin royal family. Fu Chang raised his head in surprise and looked at the old man with a red face, the old man with a red face looked at him and said. If you have not passed away unexpectedly, then you will inherit the throne. You are both legitimate and long, and you are also the crown prince with your own wings and prestige. It is natural to inherit the throne. Moreover, I know that you are not like your grandfather or father. It is because you are not here that your father appointed your second brother Fuxian as the crown prince. And you also know that your younger brother is brave and martial, but young and inexperienced in politics that's why your father emperor instructed your younger brother like that on his deathbed like in the past, Cheng Pu and Jie Xuanshua had no ulterior motives towards the Fu family and held a very prominent position within your organization. Their suggestions were also reasonable, but they were killed by your grandfather and father one after another, and your father treated this as a valuable experience to pass on to your younger brother. However, your younger brother did not have his own wings and team. Your death was actually throwing a rather complex mess to you my younger brother, who still doesn't know how to strengthen imperial power and handle political affairs, has been deposed and killed by brothers like Fu Fei and Fu Jian. However, at the same time, he has also planted trouble for himself, such as the Fu Jing Rebellion at the beginning, the Five Gong Rebellion later, and the Fu Luo Fu Zhong Rebellion, all of which have already laid the foundation of trouble since the moment of your death. Even if Fu Jian is wise, divine, and powerful, the stain of regicide and usurpation cannot be washed away. Killing the master and usurping the throne can be condemned by the people of the country Fu Chang gave a bitter smile and said, Senior, is it still useful to say these things now? I'm already dead, so for me. 
Well. Let's not say them. Fu Chang, are you 20.1 years old this year? The old man with a red face suddenly asked. Fu Chang nodded inexplicably and said, Yes, senior, what's wrong? Subsequently, Fu Chang saw the old man with a red face take out a wrinkled book resembling a ledger from his arms, and then took out a brush from his sleeve. The old man with a red face opened his mouth and sighed at the tip of the pen, then spread the book-like thing on the table, flipped through several pages, and painted a few strokes on it. Curious, Fu Chang looked up, but the old man with a red face quickly rolled up the ledger and put it back into his arms, Fu Chang only vaguely saw, for, character. Senior, who are you? Fu Chang asked the old man with a red face with some curiosity. The old man with a red face pretended to be mysterious and said, The secret of heaven cannot be revealed, kid, come here. Fu Chang stood up and approached the old man with a red face. Taking advantage of his unpreparedness, the old man lightly pushed towards Fu Chang's abdomen. Fu Chang's body immediately fell down, and the huge sense of loss frightened Fu Chang. He struggled desperately, but his body refused to obey. At this moment, the old man's words suddenly rang in his ear. Young man, remember what you said. We have a chance to see each other again. No. No. Fu Chang suddenly sat up from the bed. At this moment, his breathing was rapid, and his clothes on his back had already been soaked through with cold sweat. He swallowed a mouthful of water in shock, then reached out to wipe off the sweat beads on his forehead and touched his heart, which was beating violently at the moment. He looked around and found that he had actually returned to his eastern palace dormitory. Hu, hu, Fu Chang gasped for breath, while his close eunuch Zhong Lu hurriedly ran to the bedside and said, Your Highness, you. You finally woke up. Zhong Lu then knelt down at the bedside and cried bitterly. Looking at Zhong Lu, who was crying bitterly, Fu Chang asked, Alu, how long have I been unconscious? Zhong Lu quickly calculated with his fingers and said, Your Highness, today is already the seventh day. Alu, I ask you, is this the fourth year of the reign of Emperor Shir? Zhong Lu looked at Fu Chang with some surprise and said, Your Highness, you. You probably have amnesia, right? Don't talk nonsense, right? Zhong Lu immediately nodded and said, Yes, Your Highness. It is now October 26th in the fourth year of the reign of Emperor Shi. Fu Chang thought to himself, Indeed, I suddenly fell into a coma on October 19th, but how did I come back? Did you just have a dream just now but the real sense of falling made Fu Chang feel that it was definitely not a dream. But he didn't have time to think about these things now. He asked Zhong Lu, Where is my mother? Prince, since the day you fell into a coma, the Empress has been guarding you here for three whole days. Later, she was persuaded by His Majesty and the Crown Princess to go back and rest. Fu Chang licked his cracked lips and said, What about the Crown Princess? The Crown Princess and the Fish Side Consort have been waiting in the side hall these days. You go call them over. Note in Volume 36 of the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms, Qin recorded in the fourth chapter. When we marched to besiege Yi, we suddenly submitted a memorial to declare our allegiance to Emperor Jiazi's great and ugly days. Relying on His Majesty's benevolent will, we made the people of the six states unaware of the change of control. They were not loyal or disobedient, and did not cause any harm. We firmly reported that the general service did not exceed the time limit, but they were able to suppress the root and evil. In ancient times, I personally commanded the six divisions, and sent a telegram from the stars. The general rested and defeated the soldiers, waiting for me to arrive before taking them. Chapter 7 Fu Xing's Memories of the Past in the Jiaofang Hall You are listening at NovelFull.audio in the side hall of the Eastern Palace, Crown Princess Jiangxu and Concubine Yuan sat on stools on either side of the table. The difference was that Jiangxu had a haggard face but still sat with a strong spirit, while Yuan leaned on the table with one hand and felt drowsy. Jiangxu glanced at Yuan with some dissatisfaction, 
but in the end, she didn't say anything. At the same time, there was a rapid sound of footsteps outside the hall. Crown Princess, good news, good news, your highness the crown prince has woken up. Zhong Lu hurriedly ran into the side hall and knelt down to report to Chang Shu. Zhong Lu's sound also dispelled Yuan's drowsiness, and she quickly turned her gaze to Zhong Lu. Zhong Lu, are you telling the truth? Chang Shu couldn't contain her excitement and quickly stood up from the chair to come to Zhong Lu. Returning to the Crown Princess, it's absolutely true. His Highness the Crown Prince has just awakened and is now asking me to invite the Crown Princess and the Fish Side Consort over. Sister, since the Crown Prince has woken up, let's hurry over too. Yuan also walked up to Chiang Xu's side and said. Yes, let's go, let's go quickly. Chiang Xu nodded and then led the way, followed closely by Yuan and Zhong Lu. When she reached the entrance of the side hall, Chang Shu suddenly stopped and turned to Zhong Lu, ordering, Zhong Lu, please go and call someone to report to your majesty and my aunt, and say that my cousin has already woken up. Subsequently, the three of them also arrived at the main hall. Fu Chang was placing a pillow on his back and leaning against the bed, carefully recalling everything that had happened before. He heard footsteps and turned his head to see Chang Shu. Sister. Chang Ling, character Fu Chang, you finally woke up. Chang Xu's gaze was blurred by tears, and her voice trembled as she rushed forward to embrace Fu Chang. Yuan and Zhong Lu were also moved by it. Sister, don't cry, isn't this okay with me? Hmm. Fu Chang comforted Chang Xu's warm embrace. Do you know you almost scared me to death? Chang Xu choked and wiped her eyes. After seeing Fu Chang's cracked lips, she immediately turned to Zhonglu and said, Zhonglu, why don't you pour a glass of water for the crown prince? After hearing this, Zhonglu also slapped his forehead and said, look at my memory, I'm just happy for your highness. Then he quickly poured a glass of water and handed it to Chang Shu. Chang Shu blew the still steaming water and carefully handed it to Fu Chang, drink slowly, be careful not to get hot. Fu Chang took a small sip of water and immediately felt incredibly comfortable. In the Jiaofang Hall, Empress Chang was kneeling in front of the Buddhist niche, praying sincerely, hoping that God could save her son. Behind her, 15. Year. Old Prince Fuliu of Jin also knelt behind her mother to pray for her elder brother's blessings. Outside the hall, a figure stood at the entrance, peering into everything inside. After a moment, Fu Sheng turned around and slowly sat down on the steps in front of the hall. The cold moonlight shone on Fu Sheng, giving him a feeling of being alone. Fu Sheng looked up at the bright moon in the sky, feeling increasingly heavy. He couldn't help but think of things from his childhood. When he was five years old, he and his older brother were playing and frolicking in the courtyard with the wooden sword his father had made for them. When they were tired of playing, the two of them sat at the corner of the wall to rest. He still remembers when his older brother asked him, Brother, what is your dream when you grow up? The young man shook his head and asked, Brother, what is your dream? Me. That would naturally lead a thousand armies and horses, and then conquer the east and west to unify the world. At that time, he felt that his elder brother's dream was very ambitious, and then he replied, then I will make you a general for your elder brother, and I will fight for you in the world. After that, Xiao Fusheng added to himself, just like my father and fourth uncle. And Xiao Fu Chang also patted Xiao Fusheng's shoulder and said, Okay, then I will appoint you as my grand marshal of war and horses, and you will be responsible for dispatching all the soldiers and horses in the world. How about that? Well, no problem, Xiao Fusheng nodded heavily. By the way, there is also Fourth Uncle. Fourth Uncle Fu Xiong is the closest person Fu Xing feels besides his elder brother, because he once saved his own life. Because he had been blind in one eye since childhood, almost everyone, including his mother, did not like him, and his grandfather was no exception. At that time, he was probably seven years old. Once, his grandfather Fu Hong chatted with a waiter and said, I heard that a blind man tears in one eye, is it true? 
The waiter replied, yes. Coincidentally, he was on the side at the time. Upon hearing the waiter's words, he immediately drew his small knife from his waist and stabbed it towards his blind eye, until blood gushed out before saying to the waiter, isn't this tears? This shocked both the grandfather and the waiter, and the grandfather immediately whipped him hard on the back. He also gritted his teeth and bumped into his grandfather, saying, I was never afraid of being stabbed by a knife. How could I not bear being whipped? Grandfather was furious and cursed, if you continue like this, I will demote you to a slave. His mind heated up and he answered, Can't it be like Shile? This sentence made his grandfather feel scared and quickly covered his mouth barefoot. Later, after taking the medicine, he had intended to apologize to his grandfather, but he saw a heartbreaking scene at the door. His grandfather said to his father, This child is very cruel, you should get rid of him early, otherwise it will inevitably harm his family when he grows up. His father immediately raised his knife and was about to run away. At that moment, he was frightened and didn't know where to run. Just then, he saw through the crack in the door that fourth uncle quickly grabbed his father and urged him, third brother, children will naturally learn well when they grow up. Why do this? Then he said to his grandfather, the little doll is just playing around. It's just childlike talk, it's not like that. This finally dispelled the thoughts of his grandfather and father. On that day, he walked to the lake in disappointment. At that moment, he realized that his father didn't really like him. Just as he was thinking about whether to jump into the lake and settle himself, he was caught by his older brother who had heard about what had happened today. What's wrong with you? Birth brother. Fu Chang looked at Fu Sheng with concern. Fu Sheng's defense line in his heart finally collapsed completely. He threw himself into his brother's arms and burst into tears, saying, Big brother, I, I. Before he could finish a sentence, Fu Xing burst into tears in Fu Chang's arms. While holding his breath, Fu Chang said a sentence that still lingers in his memory to this day. Birth brother, don't be afraid, big brother. I will protect you, even if the sky falls, there will be big brother blocking you. Fu Xing gradually walked out of his memories. At this moment, tears were streaming down his face. For months ago, his fourth uncle had just passed away. Now, is it possible that even his elder brother is leaving him? At this moment, he saw a young eunuch hurriedly walking towards the palace door. Fu Xing wiped away his tears and stepped forward to stop the eunuch, saying, What are you in such a hurry to do? The eunuch quickly replied, Return to His Highness the Prince of Huainan. His Highness the Crown Prince has just awakened, and the Crown Princess has asked the servant to come and inform the Empress. What are you saying? Say it again. Fu Xing grabbed the young eunuch's shoulder and asked. His Highness the Crown Prince has woken up, and the Crown Princess has called the servant to inform the Empress. The young eunuch was also frightened by Fu Xing's appearance and quickly repeated his words. Really? Fu Xing still felt a bit incredulous. As sure as fate Fu Xing pushed away the eunuch and immediately ran towards the direction of the eastern palace, while the eunuch quickly went to report this to Empress Chang. Fu Xing stumbled into the eastern palace and saw Fu Chang sitting by the bed, half leaning against Chang Shu. At this moment, he couldn't help but say, Big brother. Fu Chang and his four companions also saw Fu Sheng. Ignoring Yuan's strange gaze, Fu Sheng ran to Fu Chang's side and knelt down on the ground, burying his head in Fu Chang's lap and crying. Looking at his second brother who was crying uncontrollably, Fu Chang jokingly said, All right, Chang Sheng, with the character Fu Sheng, get up quickly. Isn't this okay with me? Fu Sheng stood up with a sob and looked at Fu Chang with concern, Big brother, how are you feeling now? Are you feeling better? You see, isn't this okay with me? Fu Chang raised his arms and moved to prove to Fu Sheng that his body was no longer seriously affected. I knew you would definitely get better, big brother. Fu Sheng also smiled. At this moment, Fu Jian, Empress Chang, and Fu Lu also hurriedly entered the Eastern Palace. 
My son. Empress Chang saw her son sitting safely on the bed, and a big stone in her heart just landed. She quickly walked forward, and Fu Sheng stepped back to the side. Chang Shu also stood up and bowed to Fu Jian and Empress Chang, then naturally gave up her position to Empress Chang. Empress Chang sat next to her son, holding his hand with one hand and gently stroking her back with the other. Her eyes were full of concern and she said, How are you feeling now? Is there anything else that's uncomfortable with your body? Fu Chang smiled and said to his mother, Mother, rest assured that your son is already well. Empress Chang turned her head to her niece and said, Sure, have you invited an imperial physician to come and diagnose? After hearing this, Chang Shu blushed and said, Auntie, not yet. I was also happy for a moment. When I found out that Brother Chang was awake, I quickly sent someone to report to you. After hearing this, Empress Chang's face suddenly became somewhat displeased. Fu Chang looked at Chang Shu, whose face was haggard, and also spoke up to help her out. Mother, Sister A has been taking care of me here these days and hasn't rested well. Don't blame Sister A anymore. How could I blame Shuer? She's also the niece of the Queen Mother, Empress Chang smiled and said to Fu Chang. However, when Fu Sheng learned that his elder brother Su Xing had not yet invited the imperial physician to diagnose his pulse, he immediately slipped out of the East Palace and ran straight to the imperial hospital. Empress Chang instructed Zhonglu to invite the imperial physician to come and diagnose her son's pulse, while also calling her young son to her side. Chang Er, you have been unconscious for the past few days. The mother has set up a small Buddha niche in her own palace, and your brother and I pray for you every day. Hmm, Fu Chang nodded and looked around with some confusion, Hey! Where's my younger brother? He was still here just now. After hearing this, Empress Chang casually said, I guess we've gone somewhere else. We don't care about him. However, Fu Chang frowned slightly and was worried about Fu Sheng. Note. 1. Shi Lu originally came from a slave background, but he ultimately relied on opportunities and his own abilities to annihilate Wang Mi of the Western Jin Dynasty, Wang Jun of Yuzhou, Lu Kun of Bingzhou, the one who heard the chicken dance, Xiao Su of Jizhou, and Duan Pity of Liaoxi, to stop Zhu Ti's northern expedition, eliminate the former Zhao, i.e. Han Zhao, and establish the later Zhao. At that time, Fu Hong was a vassal of Shi Hu, and Fu Sheng's words made him feel afraid. 2. The conversation between Fu Sheng and Fu Hong is recorded in Qin Lu 3, Volume 35 of the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms. At the age of seven, Hong Shi asked the attendant, Do you believe me when I heard a blind child cry? The attendant said, Of course. When I was angry, I stabbed and bled with my sword, saying, This is also a tear. Hong was shocked and whipped, and he said, Your nature is patient with knives and spears, unable to be whipped and pounded. Hong said, You are an immortal, and I will take you as a slave. Hong said, Is it not as good as Shile? Hong was afraid, and he opened his mouth, calling his father Jian. This child is wild and should be eliminated early, otherwise he will break down when he grows up. A strong general will kill him, and his younger brother Xiongji said, when a child grows up, he should make changes. How can he be sudden? If he is so healthy, he will stop. Chapter 8 Collection of Currency Crown Prince's Thoughts You are listening at NovelFull.audio At this usual time, except for the few imperial physicians who were on duty as usual, the remaining people in the hospital were probably already home. However, this time, due to the sudden coma of Crown Prince Fu Chang, almost all the imperial physicians remained in the hospital for the convenience of the emperor's temporary summoning. In the lobby, Dr. Zhang, as the chief physician, looked at the nearby physician Ling Cheng Yen and said to him with some concern, Is there really no other way? At this moment, Cheng Yan's face was also as heavy as water. What else is there? You also know about the situation of the crown prince. Even if Bianquadua is alive now, he may not be able to return to heaven. 
In this situation, I estimate that only the great Luo Golden Immortal in the sky can save the Crown Prince. At the same time, there was a hint of panic in Cheng Yan's heart because he was Cheng Pu's younger brother. The three brothers were known as the three heroes of the Qing family. As the chief clerk of Emperor Huiwu, i.e. Fu Hong, posthumously conferred the title of Emperor Huiwu by his son Fu Jian, his elder brother was beheaded by Emperor Huiwu in a fit of anger due to his proposal of governing with Zhao Yanha like a separate country. Although he and his second brother Cheng Humu were not implicated, he was afraid that the emperor would implicate him due to the crown prince's affairs this time. Therefore, in the past few days, Cheng Yen can be said to have been sitting on his seat. Needle felt, deeply worried in my heart, my mouth was so anxious that bubbles started to form. At this moment, Fu Xing rushed in 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 a hurry. Cheng Yen and Zhang Tai quickly stood up to salute Fu Sheng, but were interrupted by Fu Sheng, saying, When has it been? Hurry up, Zhang Tai. My elder brother is awake. You should go over and show him. Ah! Your Highness the Crown Prince has woken up. Cheng Yen and Dr. Zhang said in unison. Hurry up, take your medicine box and come with me, Fu Sheng said anxiously. Ah, ah, good. Dr. Zhang quickly picked up his medicine box, and then Fu Sheng grabbed his hand and hurriedly walked back. Dr. Zhang was pulled out of breath by Fu Sheng and said, Why? Prince Huainan. Slow down. Slow down. I'm almost losing my old bones. Fu Xing gave Dr. Zhang a slightly angry glare, which frightened him from speaking. Then, in Dr. Zhang's shocked eyes, Fu Xing squatted in front of him and said, Hurry up, come up, I'll carry you over. Ah! This! His Royal Highness the King of Huainan! This! As Dr. Zhang was about to politely refuse, Fu Xing became anxious and said, Old man, Hurry up, you're delaying the treatment of my elder brother. Do you believe that I killed you? Now it was not Zhang Tai's turn to hesitate. He quickly hugged the medicine box and lay on Fu Xing's back. Then, Fu Xing carried Zhang Tai on his back and ran towards the direction of the East Palace. On the way, he happened to encounter Zhonglu, who was coming to invite the Tai. Fu Xing ignored Zhonglu's surprised gaze and left a sentence. Come with me quickly. Then no one was seen. Zhonglu also saw Zhang Tai on Fu Xing's back and hurriedly ran back. The Imperial Physician The Imperial Physician is here, Fu Xing shouted loudly as he ran into the Eastern Palace. Seeing his son carrying the Imperial Physician on his back, Fu Jian's eyebrows furrowed imperceptibly. Fu Xing knelt down by Fu Chang's bed, put down Dr. Zhang, and then stood up, pulling at Dr. Zhang's sleeve. Hurry up and diagnose my elder brother's pulse, he said, ah, ah. Without considering bowing to the emperor and empress, Dr. Zhang quickly signaled to Fu Chang to extend a hand and start diagnosing his pulse. After a moment, Dr. Zhang frowned and his eyes were filled with an incredulous expression, which made everyone present tremble with fear. Empress Chang asked with some concern, Dr. Zhang, how is Chang'e? Dr. Zhang withdrew his hand and then stood up to give a bow to Empress Fu Jian and Empress Chang. Returning to Empress Dowager, after my diagnosis, I can confirm that the Crown Prince is no longer seriously ill, but his body is still somewhat weak. I will prescribe some medicine to help the Crown Prince recuperate. Okay, okay, thank you. Dr. Zhang, Empress Chang said excitedly. This is the responsibility of the old minister, but now His Highness the Crown Prince should rest for a few more days before getting out of bed and moving around. After that, Dr. Zhang came to the side and wrote a prescription. Empress Chang continued to sit next to her son and said, Chang Er, let's take a good rest these days and take good care of ourselves. Mother, rest assured. Empress Chang continued, well, Empress Mother and your father will go back first. If there is anything, please ask Shuer to inform us. Then Empress Chang looked at Fu Sheng and said, Since Chang Er is fine, you should also leave the palace and return to the mansion today. Originally, 
Fu Xing had already opened his mansion outside and married the daughter of the left minister Liangan. As for Fu Lu, although he had also opened his mansion, he remained in the palace because Empress Chang told Fu Jian that Fu Lu was still unmarried and would return to live in the palace after he got married. Hmm. Fu Xing lowered his head and agreed in a muffled voice. Mother, please hurry back and rest with your father and the emperor first. These days, for the sake of your children, I have worried you, Fu Chang said to Empress Chang. Empress Chang touched her son's head and said, What are you saying? You are the son of the Queen Mother, and it is only natural for the Queen Mother to take care of you. At this moment, Dr. Zhang also wrote a prescription and said to Fu Jian, Your Majesty, I will go back to the Imperial Hospital first, decoct the medicine, and then send it over. Fu Jian nodded in agreement. Then Chang Xu and Yuan were also preparing to send Fu Jian and Empress Chang out. Just then, Fu Chang stopped Fu Sheng and said, Brother Sheng, please stay for a while. I have something to say to you. Empress Chang immediately said to Fu Sheng upon seeing the situation, Don't delay your elder brother's rest. Fu Chang also helped Fu Sheng out, saying, Mother, rest assured. I'll just have a few words with my younger brother. Empress Chang nodded and went out with Fu Jian and the others. At this moment, only Fu Chang, Fu Sheng, and Zhong Lu, who had just returned, were left in the hall. Fu Chang signaled Zhong Lu to close the door of the hall and then called the two of them to her. Big brother, what's wrong? Fu Sheng asked in confusion. Fu Chang said solemnly to the two of them, I have an important matter that I want to entrust to you too. After hearing this, Fu Sheng immediately patted his chest and promised, Big brother, just say it and I will definitely do it for you. Well, younger brother, after you leave the palace today, please have someone go to the border counties to collect the coins that the people are currently using for me, and try to collect as many as possible. No problem, big brother, don't worry, it just takes a little time. Well, I know, you don't have to worry either. Then Fu Chang looked at Zhong Lu again and said, Alu, tomorrow when you leave the palace, go to the bustling market of Chang'an city, shops and other places, and also help me collect the coins that people use now. For those larger shops, if possible, it would be best for everyone to go and take a look. Your Highness, don't worry, I understand. At this moment, Chang Xu and Yuan also returned. Seeing this, Fu Xing greeted his two sister in law and then said to his brother, Then, big brother, I'll go back first. I'll come see you in a few days. If there's anything, just ask someone to inform me. He didn't forget to frown and wink at Fu Chang. Fu Chang looked at his younger brother with a heartfelt smile and said, All right, you should go back and rest quickly. After Fu Xing left, Fu Chang looked at Yuan and said, You've been working hard these days too. Let's go back and rest well first. Yes, Your Highness the Crown Prince. After speaking, Yuan walked towards Fu Changfu and left, while Zhonglu, who was standing beside him, also walked out with great insight. Fu Chang looked at Chang Xu and saw the exhaustion in her eyes clearly. Sister, I've been bothering you these days, he said Chang Xu sat down by the bed and said, What's wrong with this? We are husband and wife, and husband and wife are one. These are all things I should do. Fu Chang leaned his head against Chang Xu's shoulder and said, Sister, you're so fragrant. As he spoke, his hands restlessly touched Chang Xu. Chang Xu's pretty face turned red and she quickly grabbed Fu Chang's hand, saying, What are you doing? Dr. Zhang said you still need to rest for the next few days. Fu Chang smiled and said, I'm not in any big trouble now, sister. You can rest assured. No, you need to rest well now. Chang Xu held Fu Chang's hand and prevented his next move. Fu Chang leaned close to Chang Xu's ear and let out a soft breath. Sister, I'm really good. If you don't believe me, give me a try. Then he pleaded, I've been feeling really uncomfortable these days. Sister, please take pity on me. Chang Xu's face turned even redder, and she lowered her head without answering. 
Fu Chang was overjoyed at the sight and moved inside. Then, with both hands wrapped around Chang Xu's slender waist, she was pulled onto the bed with a startled cry. Before Chang Xu could speak, Fu Chang took the lead in deceiving her and kissing her seductive red lips. An hour later, Fu Chang looked contentedly at Chang Xu, who had already fallen asleep beside him, with a slightly upturned mouth. Then he began to reminisce about what had happened with the red-faced old man before. At this point, he was still not very sure if what had happened before was true, but he had already thought of a way to confirm the authenticity of the matter, which was to wait for a period of time. Because in the previous images, Fu Chang clearly remembers that three major events occurred in the last two months of the year. The first event was in November of that year, when his uncle, Prince Fuan of Wudu, Fu Hong's brother, returned from the funeral of the Jin family and was captured by Yao Xiang halfway through. It was not until December that Fuan escaped from Yao Xiang. The second event was that Wang Zhu of the Liang Kingdom also surrendered with his troops in the same month. The last event was that a large dot scale famine would occur in the Guangzhou area at the end of the year, leading to a surge in grain prices. As long as these three things really happen, he can confirm that the matter between himself and the red faced old man is true, and at the same time, he can arrange the next thing. Note. According to Volume 34 of the Spring and Autumn Annals of the Sixteen Kingdoms, Qin Lu Tu recorded. In November of the fourth year of the Huangshu era, Wang Zhuo led his troops to surrender, and Jian was appointed as the Shangshu. The above general, Yen Bai, also known as Yen Tai, was appointed as the governor of Qinzhou. Jian's uncle, Wu Du Wangan, returned from Jin and was captured by Yao Xiang. He was appointed as the governor of Luozhou. In December, An Zixiang was defeated and returned. Jian took an as the Grand Marshal, General of Cavalry, Governor of Bingzhou, and Governor of Zunpushan. At the age of 38,359, he suffered from severe hunger in the middle of the earth, with a single bushel of rice and a piece of straight cloth. Chapter 9 Worried Crown Prince Wants to Change Casting you are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Half a month had passed in the blink of an eye, and a small snowfall had also fallen in Chang'an City. Fu Chang's body had also basically recovered. On this day, he was standing in the courtyard wearing a black cloak, gazing at the flying snow. At this moment, Zhonglu walked over and said to Fu Chang, Your Highness, the King of Huainan requests to see you. Fu Chang suddenly came to his senses and ordered Zhong Lu, hurry up, go and call him in. By the way, bring the coins you collected earlier with you. It turned out that Zhong Lu had already completed the task entrusted to him by Fu Chang a few days ago. However, Fu Chang considered that there was no news from Fu Xing's side yet, so he asked Zhong Lu to put away the collected coins first and take them out together when Fu Xing arrived. In no time, Fu Chang saw his younger brother who was snowing in the hall. He looked at him with concern and said, Brother, it's snowing today and you can actually come back another day. Is it freezing on the way? I'm fine, don't worry, big brother, Fu Sheng shook his head and said to Fu Chang with some concern, Big brother, something's wrong. As soon as these words were spoken, Fu Chang's heartbeat immediately reached his throat, and he immediately thought of the three major events before. He quickly asked Fu Sheng, What's going on? What's going on? Fu Sheng said indignantly, Yao Xiang's servant is too despicable. Didn't my uncle go to the Jin court to report his grandfather's funeral? But when my uncle returned, Yao Xiang's servant actually sent someone to kidnap his uncle. By the way, Wang Zhu of the Liang Kingdom heard that he was suspected by Liang Jianzhua. A few days ago, he sent someone to deliver a surrender letter to his father, and the father agreed. It is estimated that he will arrive in Chang'an by the end of December at the latest. Upon hearing this, Fu Chang was somewhat stunned. It turned out that it was not a dream, but all of this was true. He was living a life of rebirth. Big Brother Big Brother What's wrong with you? Fu Sheng looked at his brother with some confusion. Oh, I'm fine. 
Fu Chan came to his senses and said to Fu Sheng, Uncle, don't worry. Yao Xiang is also a heroic hero. I guess he won't make things difficult for Uncle. Maybe Uncle will come back soon. I hope so. Fu Sheng was somewhat skeptical about what Yao Xiang would do to Fu Wen. By the way, how have you been doing with what I asked you to do? Fu Sheng smiled and said, Don't worry, big brother. I have handled the things you entrusted me properly. He then took out a brocade bag from his body, opened it, and several copper coins fell on the table in front of him. Fu Chang and Fu Sheng sat down one after another, and then Fu Chang said to Fu Sheng, Tell me all about these. Okay, Fu Sheng picked up a copper coin with the four characters, Liang Zhao Xi and Quan, engraved on it. Big brother, I got this from Longxi County. I heard it seems to be money from the Liang Kingdom. Hmm. Fu Chang nodded slightly, as Longxi County bordered Wuxia County of Liang State, and it was normal for some coins from Liang State to circulate along the border. Big brother, and this one, I got it from Tianshui County. I heard it seems to have been minted by Li Shou from Qinghan before. Fu Xing pointed to a copper coin engraved with the characters Hanqing on the table and said. Qinghan was founded by Li Te, the son of Li Xiong, a D native of Shu County in Ijou. He was eliminated by the Jin General Huan when seven years ago. Due to the short period of the downfall of Qinghan, most of the people in Shu were still using the coins minted during the Qinghan period. To the south of Tianshui County are Chouqi Kingdom and Shu, and it is not surprising that there are also some Qinghan coins, such as Fu Chang. What about these? Fu Chang asked as he looked at the remaining ones. These are all coins minted by the Han Dynasty and the former Sun Wu. Look, big brother, these Daquan 5000 and Daquan 2000 were all minted by the former Sun Wu. This Wuzhu coin is from the Han Dynasty, and they haven't minted any new coins. They mostly use these old coins. Fu Chang picked up a Daquan 5000 and looked at it. Alu, where are you? Fu Chang suddenly shouted at Zhonglu. Zhonglu, who was originally guarding the door, quickly ran over and took out a handkerchief from his pocket. After opening it, there were several copper coins. Fu Chang looked inside and found the same five Zhu coins as Fu Sheng had brought. After picking them out, he pointed to the remaining few different coins and said to Zhonglu, Tell me about these. Yes, your highness. Zhong Lu picked up a copper coin with the words Fenghua engraved on it and said, Your Highness, look, this is the Fenghua coin ordered by Shi Lu to be minted before. Nowadays, most of us in the Great Qin and Yen states in the East use this coin. After the downfall of Shi Zhao, most of its territory was divided between Qin and Yen, and a small part was seized by the Jin court. He also knew that Qin and Yen still use Shi Zhao's coinage today. What about this one? Fu Chang asked, pointing to a coin that looked a bit similar to the Daquan 5000. Your Highness, this coin called Daquan 50 was minted by Wang Mang during the New Dynasty. After learning that the Great Spring 50 was forged by Wang Mang, Fu Chang quickly asked Zhonglu, Do you know how many people in Chang'an City currently use this Great Spring 50? Zhonglu immediately looked embarrassed and said, Your Highness, I don't know about that, but it seems that the common people are using it together with abundant goods. After listening to Zhonglu's answer, Fu Chang's face gradually became ugly. Fu Xing saw this and asked, Big brother, what's wrong? Is there any problem? Little brother, you don't know that one of the most important factors that led to the downfall of Wang Mang's new dynasty was the newly minted coins. He implemented the so dot called Six Springs and Ten Clothes policy at that time, abolishing the five bot coins. Taking this Daquan 50 as an example, its weight was only two and a half times that of the Han five bot coins, but it had to be used as 55 bot coins. This also means that every time the new dynasty issued a Daquan 50, it had to take 40.7 and a half five bot coins from the hands of the common people. Similarly, those Zhuangquan 40 and Zhongquan 30 were the same. 
In this way, he can use these virtual money to quickly plunder the wealth of the people, leading to the loss of people's hearts. I'm afraid if there are too many people using this money now, it will also put our country of Qin in crisis, this won't work, big brother. As you say, we need to quickly ban the use of this money, Fu Sheng said anxiously. Don't worry, let me think about it first. This matter needs to be done slowly, it's not urgent. Fu Chang touched his chin and said. By the way, Alu, what is most of the palace money used now? Fu Chang asked Zhonglu. Palace coins originated in the Han dynasty and were mainly used as currency for celebrations, festive decorations, and circulation among palace residents. Zhonglu thought for a moment and answered, Your Highness, the palace people are still using abundant money, and some of them are just exchanging things for things. Finally, Fu Chang first asked Fu Sheng to go back, and then he thought about how to do it on his own. His first thought was to emulate the unified currency of Qin Shi Huang. However, this was simple to say and difficult to do, especially in today's fragmented situation where the Qin state had just been established, making it even more difficult. In the end, he thought for a moment and decided to draw some templates first. Then he asked Zhonglu to bring some paper and pens and start working on them, which took most of the day. Fu Chang didn't even have dinner. Upon learning that Fu Chang had not had dinner yet, Chang Shu brought her lunchbox to the main hall and walked into it. At a glance, Chang Shu saw Fu Chang buried on the table, writing and drawing. Chang Shu walked up to the table and placed the lunchbox on it. While taking out the dishes from inside, she said to Fu Chang, Why, your body is just right now, so you're not eating or drinking anymore. Fu Chang put down his pen and paper and leaned against the stool, sighing, I can't eat it. What's the matter? Tell me about it. Chang Shu said and handed Fu Chang a bowl of kanji. Fu Chang took a sip of kanji and told Chang Shu all the things that happened today and his worries. So what do you want to do? To mint new coins, one must mint new coins that belong to my Qin dynasty, but this cannot be done in just one or two days. Do you have any further questions? Chang Shu's beautiful eyes blinked and asked. Fu Chang handed the sketch he had drawn to Chang Shu and said, Look, I plan to mint two new coins. The first type is the Great Qin Yongan, which is divided into Ping Qian, Wan Wan, Zhe Er, and Zhe Wu. Zhe Wu Chong Wu Zhu is just to imitate the Han Dynasty's five Zhu Qian and change the name. Ping Qian weighs one Zhu, Zhe Er Chong Er Zhu, and then the second type is the Great Qin Xiangjia, which is divided into Zhe San and Zhe Ten. Zhe San Chong San Zhu and Zhe Ten are modeled after the Qin dynasty's half Liang Qian and Wei Twelve Zhu. Are you trying to restore coins from the Qin and Han dynasties? I can't do anything about it. Nowadays, only the half Liang coins from the Qin dynasty and the five Zhu coins from the Han dynasty have the best reputation among the people. For example, when the Han dynasty was first established, the Han Emperor Lu Bang once minted half Liang coins that weighed eight Zhu. Although they were all called half Liang coins, they were four Zhu less than those from the Qin dynasty, which led to the people not buying them in the end. As for the highest discount, which was set at ten, I think it was enough. Otherwise, if Wang Mang produced a pile of cloth nine hundred and large cloth yellow Qian, one of which was equivalent to a thousand five Zhu coins, with such a large face value, the people wouldn't even consider me a good deal. I ate it alive and peeled it off upon hearing Fu Chang's words, Chang Shu couldn't help but smile and said, I didn't expect you to be so concerned about the people in your heart. The common people are actually very simple. Hey, if you can make more concessions that are more beneficial to the people, let's make more concessions. Mainly, it's not possible to exchange all the coins in the country at once in a short period of time. Just producing so many types of coins would require a lot of copper material, and it's not certain whether the common people will buy them or not. The most important issue I'm afraid of is how to make this money flow to Jin, Liang, and Yen. Hmm. I think if we really follow what you said, the people will definitely accept it, 
but this copper material and this circulation issue are indeed a bit difficult to deal with. Suddenly, Chang Shu's spiritual light flashed and she said, why not use iron and lead to forge new money? Iron and lead. Chang Shu shook her head again and said, no, 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 in this case the people will definitely not buy it. If we really use iron and lead to mint new coins and issue them, then Jin, Liang, Yen and other countries will still use copper coins, while our country will use iron and lead coins. This is also not acceptable. Chang Shu was also somewhat speechless. How could she come up with such a foolish way? Although iron and lead are better to obtain than copper, and the stock of iron and lead is also more than that of copper, this has led to iron and lead being cheaper than copper, and iron and lead are more difficult to preserve than copper. That is why throughout history, copper was mainly used as the main material for coins, rather than iron and lead. Note. 1. In ancient times, copper was mainly used to cast coins instead of iron and lead because the stock of copper discovered in ancient China was relatively small, while the stock of iron was relatively large. Therefore, Copper is more easily used to represent wealth. The chemical properties of copper are more stable than that of iron, and it is not easy to oxidize and rust, making it suitable for making currency. Early iron, mostly pig iron, is prone to chemical changes. On the other hand, lead has a softer texture and long dot term use is prone to lead poisoning. 2. The currency of the 16 kingdoms period of the Two Jin dynasty. Neither Jin dynasty minted new coins, but used the five Zhu coins, Wang Mang coins, Half Liang coins, Wu coins, and Shu coins. Among the sixteen kingdoms, there were Liang Zhao Xian Quan from Qianliang, or Baoliang, Feng Huiqian from later Zhao, Hanxing Qian from Qinghan, and Daxia Xinxing, also known as Taixia Xinxing, from Daxia. Historical records show that Fu Jian of former Qin destroyed two copper coins cast during the reign of Qin Shi Huang, originally twelve, Dong Zhu destroyed ten minted coins, but left a mystery due to missing the names of the coins. 3. Before the Tang dynasty, copper coins were mostly based on weight, such as half Liang coins and five Zhu coins, era names, Han Xing coins, country names plus era names, the Xia and Xing coins, Era names plus auspicious language, Tai Qing Fong Lu coins, Era names plus weight, Tai He 5 Zhu coins, Tian Jia 5 Zhu coins, etc. Common coins such as Tong Bao, earliest seen as Kaiyuan Tong Bao minted by Tang Gaozu, Yuan Bao, earliest seen as one Yuan treasure minted by Shi Siming, and Zhong Bao, earliest seen as Qian Yuan Zhong Bao minted by Tang Suzong, emerged in the Tang dynasty. As for why they were named Duchin Yongan and Duchin Xiangjia, it is because of their good symbolism and convenience, such as the need to mint new coins every time the era name money is changed, which is too cumbersome.